Okay, so let's get started. Good morning or good afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you are. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Kim Walski, and as chair of the organizing committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th annual sustainability pre-conference. I say that with great pride, all the, the credit for having a decade of this pre-conference goes to all of the former chairs and organizing committees, many of whom are here joining us today. Um, so, you know, I think many of us over the years have wished that we could have a low carbon version of a conference. This is not the circumstances that we thought we would be doing this under, but in crisis there is an opportunity and uh, we're thrilled that we have twice as many registered participants as we can normally fit into a hotel conference room. So welcome if you are a first time comer. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and uh, happy to see that this community is growing. Um, while we wait for people to trickle in, let me introduce you to the rest of the fabulous organizing committee uh, with whom we could not have pulled this off uh, without them. Uh, so we have Caitlin Ramey, who is the past chair, uh, Jenny Cole, Julie Cray, Katie Lacasse, Lexi Sharmer, Nicole Sintoff, and Greg Sparkman. Uh, you'll see on Caitlin's profile, I have highlighted her Twitter handle because she has taken on the challenging task of live tweeting the entirety of today's conference. So you can follow along and retweet her. And if you yourself are on social media, please use the hashtag SPSPSP21. Um, I also want to thank uh, Wes Schultz, who has served the role as, of senior advisor and helped connect us with the broader international community of environmental psychologists. Um, and let me just point out here that uh, we are always looking for others to join the organizing committee. The planning for 2022 will start in a few months. So if you would be interested in that, please feel free to email me. Uh, we welcome you, whether you are a student, a faculty member, a practitioner, it doesn't matter. We are just looking for fresh ideas and a commitment to making this a great pre-conference. So um, let me also say that if this is the first time you are joining this pre-conference, I hope that by the end of today, you realize that it's more than just a conference. It's really a community of scholars. Um, I assume many of you became members of SPSP to get the discounted registration rate. And just to point out that if you sign into the SPSP website and hit this big orange connect button, there is a sustainability forum that you can use to stay in touch with folks who attended this, but also other social psychologists broadly interested in uh, environmental and sustainability psychology. And I also want to point out that today's pre-conference is co-sponsored by APA Division 34, or the Society for Environmental Population and Conservation Psychology. Um, sometimes I get this question from grad students, like, is it a competition between professional societies? It's not. You can be a member of both. Um, and Division 34 is another one to be connected with. There's actually a free listserv that you can join uh, to be connected with news and events there. And there's a number of us who are members of both. Our, I think our current president, uh, Daniel Beckendorf, and our past president, Ezra Markowitz, are, will be participating today. And by pure coincidence, I'm president-elect of that. So if you want to find out more about Division 34, please reach out to us. Um, and I just want to sort of take the next five minutes before we turn over to the keynote to sort of set the stage for today. So we picked this topic of climate change at a crossroads back in April or May of last year. And uh, our, our motivation was in part that obviously there is an urgent need to act on climate soon. Um, but also that the world was completely turned upside down. It was the very beginning of the pandemic and life as we know it was very quickly changing. So our motivation for today is to try to understand how do we move the needle forward on climate 
And how do we do that recognizing how much the world has changed? Um, I think originally when we picked this, at least my thought process was, well, how does the pandemic change uh, the state of things? I think as we've seen by the end, it's really how does the entirety of 2020 change how we think about climate change engagement? Um, we already know that in the best of times, environmental issues tend to be a lower priority for folks than say the economy or healthcare or job security. And all of those systems have just been further stressed by the pandemic. So there's a large open question of, you know, does climate change still fit within someone's pool of worry? Um, we faced all kinds of challenges in 2020 um, with the, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, in some respects, we saw how people can really come together quickly and to, to show that they care deeply about an issue with the Black Lives Matter movement. We have seen, of course, the flip side of this of people coalescing when they don't like having someone tell them how to change their behavior. So I think there are probably lessons in, in both of these movements, so to speak, that we need to take into account as we think about how to get collective action on climate change. This past year has also been this grand experiment in how do you influence individual behavior. I think for all of us who count among our hats being a behavioral scientist, this has tested our ability to predict uh, how people will behave and how we design interventions to influence them. And of course, at least here in the US, it has been a year where we have seen further and further division among political parties and along ideological lines. So we are faced with all of these questions and uncertainties of how do we move people forward on climate change, given the division among people, given the challenges we are facing with the pandemic um, and its consequences on the economy and otherwise. So some of these questions are going to help frame the sessions that we will have later today. I do, though, want to point out this hope. Um, I don't know that any of us, when we planned this conference, would have predicted that by the time we were having this pre-conference today, we would already have a president in place who is not only you know, behind acting on climate change, but has made it a priority within his first month of being in office. Um, and now we're seeing action from, you know, one of the biggest auto manufacturers saying that they're going to get rid of gas and diesel vehicles. So we are seeing action in positive directions. Um, but I will say, just because policies or technologies become available, as we all know, it doesn't mean that people necessarily go along with them or adopt them. There can often be that, that horrible intention to behavior gap where, or attitude to behavior gap where it's difficult to get people to follow through. And so there is a, a much bigger need for our science and our research right now in helping shape interventions uh, that will encourage people to take low carbon actions. So we have arranged the day around several panels and blitz sessions that sort of speak to these different themes. Uh, we've got an invited panel coming up after the keynote that will look at how do we encourage collective action, um, taking lessons from, say, what's happened in Flint, Michigan, but also what do we know with regard to COVID-19. We'll have a blitz session of short five-minute talks, all of them sort of loosely themed around climate and society. Uh, we'll have a poster session in the middle of the day, and I'll come back to that in a second. We've got another panel that kind of looks at identity and political ideology issues. And then our final blitz for the day, which is looking more at individual behavior. Um, the poster session, let me just point out. So this is normally a time of the day where we'd all go grab a cup of coffee and walk around and really get to socialize with each other. It's unfortunate that we can't do it face to face, but I hope you will take the time uh, to go do this uh, through the Whova app. And I'm just realizing, give me a second to bring my control panels back up. 
I emailed this out to folks, but if you need some help finding which poster sessions to go to, we have organized them thematically. Unfortunately, on the the Whova app, it's just random order how they appear. So um, I encourage you to check this out. The session is at 2.15 Eastern. We have many early career researchers. Um, I'm going to venture for some of them. This is their first research presentation. So please find the time to, to go meet with them. And uh, the last thing I will point out before switching over to our keynote is that, as is tradition, we vote on the best student presenters, um, both for the blitzes and the posters. So keep an eye out. We will send you links on how to vote for those. Um, and this is a fun tradition. And we will, in fact, send the winners one of these snazzy looking mugs. Um, let me just pause right there to see if anyone has any questions about how things are running on Zoom, feel free to pop them in the chat. I should also say that everything is going to be recorded and at some point this will appear on the Whova app. So if you have a conflict, you'll be able to catch up on what you missed. I don't see any questions. So um, let me stop sharing my screen. And for those of you who are just joining for the keynote, um, we are very fortunate this year to have Dr. Shazin Atari joining us, who I think is going to speak a little bit more to the challenges of motivating individuals on climate change. Um, Dr. Atari is an associate professor at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University Bloomington. And prior to joining IU, she was a postdoc at the Earth Institute and the Center for Research on Environmental and Environmental Decisions, or CRED, as many of us know it, at Columbia University. And she received her PhD in Civil and Environmental <clears throat> Engineering and Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, Dr. Atari and her lab do research on a variety of topics, looking at sort of perceptions, motivations, barriers, um, trying to understand how people make sense of complex systems and use natural resources. And as you'll see, a lot of this is in relation to energy and climate. Um, she has received more accolades than we will have time to go over, but most recently she was honored by Indiana University with a Bicentennial Medal for her outstanding contributions in broadening the reach of the university globally. And in 2018, she was named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow in recognition for her high caliber work that also addresses important and enduring issues confronting our society. Um, and I think that's sort of the theme of Shaz's work is that it's high caliber, but also of practical value. You can find it published in journals such as PNAS, but also written up in publications like the New York Times and The Economist. And I will just say that if you are an early career researcher, you cannot go wrong in studying Shaz's research record. Um, she is particularly gifted. Sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, Shaz. She is particularly gifted at asking research questions that I think really contribute to basic science, but are also very meaningful to society. And she has some really beautifully clever research designs to test them. So um, before I hand it over, the way this will work, because there's so many of us, please put your questions into the chat and I will pick and choose from them for the Q&A after her talk. And then I believe at 10 past the hour, we will open up a breakout room for 10 minutes. And if you want, you can sort of approach the, uh, approach the podium and, and talk to Shaz one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, without further ado, join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Shazina Tari. Good morning, everyone. Um, Wow, that was quite the introduction. I should just stop uh, talking now and just take questions. Um, <laughs> uh, Kim, thank you so much for this warm and kind invitation. Um, I feel so honored to be here to talk to our community. Um, 
especially with so many friends, so many leaders in the field. Um, I, I just received an email from Tom Deed saying there's, there's even um, a student from a high school in the audience. So just everyone, a warm uh, welcome um, to SBSBSB. So today what I'll be talking about is um, a lot of my research over the past decade. So I'll be going through papers relatively fast, but the way I've arranged today's talk is by um, having three separate sections. The first focusing on perceptions, the second focusing on communications, and the third focusing on a crazy idea that I've been chipping away at for the past year and a half, and sort of um, highlighting some areas that I think our community especially should uh, be able to help with. So where are we today? Um, the two big challenges, especially if you care a lot about climate change, are the following. We really need to figure out how to stabilize CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere to limit warming. So as you know, um, CO2 concentrations have kind of followed a very steep, steep uh, linear trajectory. Uh, every year I keep updating slides saying, all right, we're right now at 415 parts per million uh, and it keeps going up. So we really need to figure out how do we stabilize concentration. And then given we've not made much progress in sort of stopping in, on the first task, our community really needs to figure out how to adapt to climate change impacts to limit welfare losses. Those are sort of the two big challenges ahead and they're really difficult. They're really um, uh, scary um, uh, problems that we're, that we're sort of charged with. Where are we right now? So um, in terms of warming projections, we've already surpassed one degree worth of warming. We're sort of on trajectory to get to um, roughly uh, two degrees to three degrees of warming. And when you think about it in terms of a, a, a thermometer, this is kind of where we are. This is where the Paris Agreement puts us, which a lot of climate change experts and energy modelers say that we're not going to reach given current standards and given current policies. Um, this is where we're headed. And what this means, like this is the way I'm communicating this information is very numeric and it's void of a lot of the feelings that we need to sort of embed into, this, into these numbers. But that world is really, really different from the world we're in today. And so how do we help people understand what that world is and learn to adapt to that world? So where are most of our emissions coming from? They're actually coming from our energy use and our agricultural um, practices. And so in terms of where our uh, research in our lab has focused on, we've really tried to understand um, the behavioral components of energy use. So in terms of how to motivate action, there are many different models and some of the attendees today have written papers about theories of how to investigate these two aspects. But uh, our lab has sort of been looking at this in lockstep. What are the information deficits and what are the motivation deficits and how do we merge the two together to holistically address climate action? So the first part that I'll be talking to you today deals with all of these papers. I've just listed them here uh, in case you want to read more because I will not be talking to you about methods, but just very quickly talking to you about um, some of our big findings from um, our exploration. So the first thing that I would like to highlight is that since Willett Kempton sort of started off uh, parts of this investigation in the 1980s, when people are asked, in your opinion, what is the most effective thing you could do to conserve energy in your life? Most people, in fact, 20%, and this number hasn't changed much since the 1980s, say turning off the lights. Now, turning off the lights is good, but it's not the most effective thing you can do. And in fact, Gardner and Stern say that turning off the lights tend to have a minimal impact on climate change. So we have this really faulty heuristic that's taught when we're very young, how do we break it apart? The first thing that I'd like to highlight, and this is work done by Seth Wines and Kimberly Nicholson and uh, Nicholas, and what they highlight is, all right, what are actions that can decrease uh, our CO2 emissions? And they sort of focus on eating plant-based diets, switching to electric vehicles, and that's something Kim highlighted in her introduction, buying green energy, so on and so forth. So there are these effective actions that we can focus on but 
a lot of people don't might not know what these actions are, or they don't think that these actions apply to their own lives. So some of my PhD work actually focused on people's perceptions of energy use, um, especially coming in from physics and engineering. I was really interested in how people perceive in terms of psychophysics, how much energy different appliances use in their day to day lives. Uh, what I first realized very quickly is that most people do not understand the difference between power and energy. So when you say watts versus watt hours, most people don't know the difference. So what we said was imagine a 100 watt light bulb being left on for one hour uses 100 units of energy. How many units of energy would different appliances take? On the y-axis here, you have people's perceptions. On the x-axis, you have actual energy used or saved. And data that falls along this diagonal y is equal to x line means people's perceptions match reality. And what we find is, and I'll walk you through this data, is that in general, there's a lot of significant underestimation, especially at the high end of energy use. So then the question is, why is that? And how do we hold on to this curve and pull it up towards the diagonal? So let me walk you through some specific examples. So lap laptops, the amount of energy used by a laptop in one hour is overestimated by a factor of two. People think it's equivalent to one light bulb being left on for an hour, but it's actually equivalent to half. Uh, dishwashers are underestimated by a factor of nine. People think it's equivalent to two light bulbs when it's actually equivalent to 18. And changing the washer setting from hot to cold is underestimated by a factor of 40. So people think it's equivalent to saving one light bulb when it's actually equivalent to saving 40 light bulbs. So this, as I said, was published um, almost a decade ago um, from my PhD work. And then the question that we've sort of been uh, chipping away at is how do you hold onto this curve and pull it up towards the diagonal? And also, is it useful to do that? Like how important are accurate perceptions in how we navigate this world and how we use energy? So more recently, um, we investigated providing an expert heuristic to participants to see whether that helps them improve their um, estimations of energy use. So in, a, in an experimental design, what we told some participants was large appliances that primarily heat and cool things use a lot more energy than people think. And what we find is, is that number one, this is the original curve from the 2010 paper, which is completely replicated. So those findings are pretty strong and um, steadfast. But when you provide a heuristic, you get a steeper uh, uh, curve, a steeper, uh, steeper slope. What that means is, is that the heuristic actually does improve people's estimations of energy use. When you provide people multiple anchors along the diagonal line, that actually also improves people's perceptions. And then finally, if you provide both anchors and heuristics, that really is the steepest of all of the different conditions. So we are able to improve people's uh, perceptions by providing these expert heuristics. The next thing that we um, looked at, and this is work that just got published two days ago, is we, um, and this is work primarily done by Jill Kappenbacher, who's now a professor at um, University of South Dakota, is that we interviewed three different groups of experts, electrical engineers, physicists, and energy analysts, to understand what heuristics they use in order to make decisions about home energy use, in order to sort of extract a library of heuristics. So we had one that we tested, but we wanted to extract and create a whole library of them in order to test different permutations and combinations of them to help figure out what can we provide people to help them understand energy a little bit better. And so here are some of the top heuristics that we found, and I'll walk us through some of them. So a greater temperature change requires more energy than a smaller change. Insulation helps reduce energy use, especially ones for heating and cooling. Devices that become hot to touch use more energy than similar devices that don't. Devices that need to be cooled while working use a lot of energy, and LED lights do not use a lot of energy. So these heuristics um, are sort of um, are pretty exciting to me. As I said, they just came out, um, and so we're in the process of trying to investigate how effective they can be in terms of uh, influencing behavior. What's also really cool, and this is me geeking out on data, is that um, the no comparing novices to experts. So remember, novices had a slope of roughly 0.28. 
experts roughly have a slope if you average them and there are no significant differences between these three expert groups of roughly 0.63. So we're almost doubled the slope of novices when it comes to experts. What's also really interesting is experts don't have perfect, perfectly accurate perceptions. Um, so energy is really hard to understand. Uh, experts that are forced to make these estimates without doing back of the envelope calculations also suffer from the same overestimation and underestimation biases. So as I said, our current work is testing combinations of useful heuristics designed to improve energy estimates and choices. And what we're really interested in understanding is what combination of heuristics help. How long will these, will these heuristics be remembered? And can they replace less use, useful heuristics like turning off the lights um, that I talked about initially? So this is sort of um, uh, talks about a lot of the perceptual work um, looking at individual home energy use. Next, and this is a paper that came out early last year, is we really wanted to understand this political division that Kim also uh, mentioned at the beginning of uh, today's um, uh, conference, we asked participants what they think the current energy mix is and what they hope the future energy mix would look like in the year 2050. And so the energy mix here is defined as energy sources used for electric power, transportation, industrial, commercial, and residential sectors. So the entire um, uh, third chart that I showed you, the entire sort of uh, it, uh, energy system. And what we uh, first uh, this graph shows is that what the current energy system looks like in the United States. So the black dots represent the total amount of um, oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, biomass, hydro, wind, solar, and geothermal in our current energy mix. And again, this includes transportation. That's where the oil and petroleum comes in. And so here are people's perceptions uh, divided up by conservative, moderate, and liberal. And what we find is, I'm going to first talk about these different trends. Uh, participants tend to underestimate the current contribution of oil and natural gas. They tend to overestimate coal slightly because they might not be aware of this um, uh, uh, re a replacement of coal with natural gas that's been happening in our energy system. And they tend to overestimate wind, solar, and geothermal and hydro. What's also really interesting is that across the board between conservatives, moderates, and liberals, everyone really wants a decarbonized energy system. Yes, there are some small differences between how decarbonized they want it, but in general, there's this huge push towards um, extreme decarbonization, which is really hopeful, really positive, um, and really amazing given all of the differences we've been talking about to date in our field. Unfortunately, um, there are some significant differences between how we get to this beautiful, amazing future in 2050. There are significant differences between um, how liberals and conservatives think about decarbonization policies and anti-decarbonization policies. So across the board, except for some like nuclear, you see sort of uh, um, liberals having stronger support for decarbonization policies than conservatives, which sort of uh, center around neutral and the opposite trend for anti decarbonization policies. So we have a shared pathway, we have a shared vision of the future, but we need to figure out shared pathways of getting to this amazing future. Um, there are also lots of differences between what is the most important problem today. Um, climate change tends to be a problem for the world in the future as opposed to today, and a lot of the other problems are, are more important today than in the future. So in terms of a summary for the great news is both conservatives and liberals want a decarbonized energy mix. The tough news is we need to figure out how to get there. So that's sort of the end of the first uh, part of the talk. The second part looks at communication. So when I was a postdoc at Columbia, I actually went to a, a conference, I flew to this conference and I gave a talk on <laughs> looking at people's perceptions of energy, similar to what I did today. And someone in the audience stood up and said, hey, you flew to this meeting, why should I listen to what you have to say? And to me, that was very surprising and shocking because that's a classic ad hominem attack. And I went back to Dave Krantz and Elke Weber, who were my postdoc mentors, and I was scratching my head saying, hey, I don't understand this. We need to sort of study how and why this is happening and what the strengths are of these types of arguments, especially when it comes to behavior change and policy uptake. So this is sort of the list of papers that have come out of that line of research. 
what are ad hominem attacks? They're basically attacks to the person rather than the argument. And so there's been a lot of work that's looked at how much our carbon footprints as academics tend to um, be relatively high. Uh, academic researchers are among the highest emitters because we fly to a lot of conferences and project meetings and field work. And there's a huge push towards trying to figure out a roadmap to reduce our emissions. And this is work done by the Tyndall Center and uh, Lorraine Whit uh, Whitmarsh. And so um, a couple of folks have actually looked at their own carbon footprints. And this is Eric Holdhouse, who's a journalist, and Peter Kalmas, who's a NASA researcher and also an activist in this space. And flying does tend to dominate. So um, there's, and I mentioned that's also been a push to try to get us, our community, to decrease our carbon footprint. And so what we did in this sort of set of studies is we tried to understand what is the loss of credibility when um, a, a hypothetical climate communicator has a high or low carbon footprint. So I'm going to walk you through some of the results relatively quickly. So we had a high flying carbon communicator, both male and female, low flying carbon communicator, um, climate communicator, male and female, a climate communicator who buys lots of offsets, a uh, climate communicator who has a high home carbon footprint and a low home carbon footprint. And so what we find is that in general, females and males are treated the same. So that's good news. Um, people are uh, climate communicators that have a high a home carbon footprint have the lowest amount of credibility, the highest credibility is for a low home carbon footprint, and offsets do not wipe the slate clean. They're somewhere between high fly and low fly. So these results were kind of surprising to our, our team. We wanted to study them even more thoroughly. So we had a second study where we really tried to tweak each of the different components. So one was later you learn, one was an audience audience raises their hand and asks a question. And uh, the findings are relatively robust. So offsets in general fall in between high and low fly. Um, high home is sort of the worst credibility, low home is the best credibility. Um, what we also find is that researcher credibility does have, uh, is correlated with the proportion of our participants who intend to conserve energy. So when you go from extremely low researcher credibility to extremely high researcher credibility, the proportion of our participants who would be, in, who will intend to conserve energy go from roughly 30% to 90%. And again, this is willingness to conserve energy, not actual behavior, but it's uh, a pretty stark finding from our perspective. So even though flying dominates my carbon footprint, that's not what I'm judged by. I'm actually judged by my home energy use. And there are a couple of reasons for that. It could be that people don't know that flying dominates my carbon footprint. And it could also be that um, people might sort of say, hey, you know, she needs to fly for her work, but her home is sort of an indication of who she is. And so those are hypotheses. We haven't worked those out as yet. Um, so in summary, um, ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use can be highly effective for all of the reasons I just pointed out. And these effects on credibility and intentions to save energy occur strongly for varied audiences. So when our first paper came out, we actually got attacked by a few activists saying, hey, you know, individual behavior is great, but we really need a price on carbon. We really need policy changes. And I'm sure everyone in our community has heard this sort of um, push and pull between individual behavior and system-wide change. And so um, this was a comment made by Michael Mann on our research. And so what we did was we actually um, went to some experts and identified six different policies, and then we tested them with a high or low home energy use carbon footprint. And those were regulating carbon dioxide as pollutant, taxing carbon emissions, increasing nuclear power, stabilizing human population, increasing renewable energy, and increasing public transit. And what we find is this amazing stepwise um, uh, result where when you have a low carbon footprint, you tend to have a little bit higher support than a high carbon footprint for almost all of these policies, which have been arranged from lowest support, which is population stabilization, to highest support, which is renewable energy. And there's no significant difference between these two conditions for renewable energy, but there is significant difference for the rest. So um, what does this difference translate to in terms of real world um, practice? We actually don't know. 
Um, and so that's, again, work that needs to be done in the future. Uh, and finally, sort of, uh, I grew up in Dubai and I went to Catholic school, so I was really interested in Reformation. So, all right, I was a climate sinner. What happens if I become a climate saint? So we tested three separate levels, no reform, some reform and complete reform. And what we find, um, and I'm gonna skip over some of the details, is what we find is that if you were a climate sinner and now you reform, you are judged based on your new carbon footprint as opposed to what you, um, the, the lifestyle that you were leading. Um, and so some reform and complete reform, complete reform is relatively close to uh, the low home carbon footprint from study, from the original study. And finally, with Greg Sparkman, um, this was really interesting work trying to figure out, does it matter who the communicator is? And does it matter how sustainable you are? Like, do we really need to be super duper crazy, crazy sustainable and sort of, you know, compost our own human waste? Or, um, you know, uh, is it all right for us to sort of be human and just try our very, very best? And so what we find in this work, and please feel free to ask Greg some follow-up questions as well, is that um, there is partial evidence for do-gooder derogation for neighbors and experts, where um, experts who are, ex who are seen to be super extreme are not um, as favorable as uh, experts who are somewhat sustainable. And so to summarize sort of that line of research, is that ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use of the climate researcher, especially home energy use can be highly effective. The credibility slate can be wiped clean by the climate researcher decreasing their carbon footprint in the present. Uh, there is partial evidence for do good or derogation for both neighbors and experts and highly sustainable advocates are not more influential than somewhat sustainable ones. And instead they can be viewed as marginally worse off and experts are most credible and influential when they adopt many sustainable behaviors in their day-to-day -day lives, as long as they're not viewed as too extreme. So this is sort of the end of the second part of my talk, and I would like to sort of um, just plant the seed ideas for some of the new work that I've been um, thinking about. So as, um, as some of you know, like I love stories, I love reading, I love narrative, and what I've been thinking about for the past couple of years is how do we use narratives to fuse facts and feelings? Because it's not enough just to sort of provide people with these heuristics because the heuristics feel very informational. They don't tell me why I should be caring about this problem. And if you look at the Gallup polls and the Pew polls, climate change is still at the bottom of the list when it comes to the most important problem facing the world today, the United States today, so on and so forth. And so stories have this magical power of uh, fusing uh, artistry and actionable plans together to sort of show a hero's journey or multiple hero's journeys. And they can show how a problem was solved and how to provide a template for how to solve other problems that are similar to it. And so uh, one of the books that I've loved uh, reading was Richard Powers, The Overstory, where he says in this book that the best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a really good story. And so I've been asking people, collecting lots of data on this, um, and most um, I've been pretty much failing pretty hard in this uh, project because it's such a challenging project because it combines both qualitative research and quantitative research. Um, uh, and I'll explain some of the reasons why um, the failure has been pretty uh, uh, amazing. But I've been asking people what stories have changed them to try to figure out patterns in their answers and what changes have come off these stories that they've been reading um, and thinking and sort of um, ever since they were kids. And some stories, and I won't talk about too many of them, is uh, uh, the idea of David and Goliath. Like, you know, it's a small, sort of the small hero facing this large monster. And that sort of repeats across a variety of different stories that we read. And this is the classic Balrog scene from Lord of the Rings, which is a really powerful um, uh, visual effect because whenever I say the Balrog, I can just imagine Gandalf in my head, you know, planting his staff saying, you shall not pass. And so parts of the idea that I've been um, sort of um, grappling with is the, how do you fuse facts and feelings, which is, what should I do about the situation? What is my call to action? And then how do I feel about the situation? And what is the intensity of my feeling? And I would love to hear more ideas, especially from our community about that. 
So some of the features that I've been studying is what makes the narrative memorable, the idea of emotional and cognitive scaffolding. So I feel like expert heuristics provide cognitive scaffolding for people to understand something that is relatively complex, uh, even something that experts might struggle to understand. Um, but what does emotion, emotional scaffolding look like? And then the need for implementation plans. There are lots of challenges with this type of research because deep narratives take time to influence behavior, which make them really hard to study experimentally. Um, we need to move beyond marketing and we're, because we're not selling a specific policy, but rather why we need climate policies more generally. And then we also need to bridge the growing partisanship. And this is sort of, um, so the summary for a lot of the projects that I've talk, talked to you about today is that we need both facts and feelings, information and motivation to foster useful change. I think it's really important to break down faulty heuristics such as turning off the lights and embed more useful heuristics into stories as um, sort of uh, uh, ways of uh, providing this uh, information uh, in terms of um, both motivation and information. We also highlight that conservatives and liberals are more similar than we might think. They have a shared vision for a decarbonized future energy system, even though they were struggling to figure out pathways of getting there. And as Kim pointed out initially, there's lots of hope uh, with the new administration. And in terms of our own climate communication, I think it's important to discuss with our audience what we are doing to decrease our carbon footprint. And here's my last slide. These are things that I think are open ideas for our community and I would love to get your feedback on. So how do we actually operationalize facts and feelings, this fusing of information and motivation? Stories seem really, really hard, or maybe they're just really, really hard to me. So if you figured them out, please let me know how. Uh, share your work with me. Um, so that's one idea. Another idea that I've been grappling with is how do we connect individuals to the larger system? There's this false dichotomy that a lot of people have been writing about saying, oh, you know, individual behavior does not matter. We just need a price on carbon. And I think that that's really problematic because individuals are embedded parts of our system. And if we, if we ignore them, we can't really have the system-wide change that we need. And so a lot of the changes that we need, according to me, in my humble opinion, rest on both political will and public support. And so we need to sort of empower individuals to feel like their um, actions matter. Uh, this, the third idea is we need rapid decarbonization much faster than even a lot of the policies that the Biden administration has put forward. A lot of uh, papers are coming out. In fact, a new paper just came out two days ago by Adrian Rafferty and uh, Lou that showed that we only might have a 5% chance of actually meeting the Paris um, targets given the new state of the world that we find ourselves in. And so with a rapid decarbonization, we also need to couple that with fast, effective adaptation. And there's a huge need for social scientists because as, as COVID has taught us, it's not just a natural science or biological science problem. We, we need to understand people and understand behavior very uh, quickly in order to help us deal with the new world that's um, already starting to happen. And finally, and this is more of a personal, um, a personal realization after working on this for a really long time, is that I think we also need to acknowledge that uh, this is a really challenging problem and there's a lot of both climate grief and burnout. And so there's a huge push to sort of both take care of yourself first before sort of pushing yourself um, and your ideas onto this problem because um, I've had both uh, professors that I know leave the field because they're really burnt out by climate change as a problem and um, the same with students. And so uh, remember to put your air mask on first before dealing with the other problems that we are facing as a research community. And with that, I would like to end my talk and open it up to questions and discussions. And thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me to share these ideas with you today. Thank you. Yes, please join me in giving a virtual round of applause <laughs> using your reactions. So yeah. we are happy to take questions. Uh, you can type them into the chat. Um, 
I think because there's only one speaker and we have some time, if you want to raise your hand and speak, we can do it for this session. Maybe I'll kick off while we wait for other questions to bubble in. Um, I was really fascinated by uh, the study with the current energy mix and seeing that people are rather aligned and that they want to decarbonize the energy mix, but of course have very different perceptions of solutions. And from what I recall of your doctoral research of energy perceptions of household goods, people sort of had an open-ended question of what they thought uh, was an effective way to, to reduce energy use. I'm curious, did you do that for the for this current energy mix study as well? Like people want to decarbonize, but how do you, for example, get conservatives to come up with a solution that they're happy with to get there? That's a great question. We have not looked at that in terms of uh, this particular study, but a new study done by um, uh, our, my doctoral student, Deidre Miniard, actually took this project and she went into a variety of different communities in our state in Indiana, which as many of you know, is uh, ruby red. Um, it's a ruby red state. And so she asked people, how do they want to decarbonize? And in general, the themes that come up are not climate change, it's job, job creation and um, air pollution. At least that's what her findings are. So the open-ended component was not in the work that's been published already, but it's in ongoing work in our state. And that, those are pretty challenging as well because, um, I mean, if we can make Indiana, as I said, to go from ruby red to emerald green, that would be really great. But um, some of the some of her work Id identifies why it's going to be so hard. Right, I, and I have to say, I'm originally from Indiana, so I oh, feel. Go. Go <laughs> yeah. Go and, and I apologize. I walked you guys through like I think I don't know twenty studies or so. <laughs> <laughs> but is it a very hard hold on and, and, bu and buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have a question from Holly Berman, and I will apologize because I'm going to make sense of this as I read it. But thinking about bolstering individual action to support system-wide change, um, I get a lot of hope from youth movements like Sunrise. Do you think this type of organizing might drive individual empowerment, hopefully across age groups, not just youth? I'm not sure I'm familiar with Sunrise. Uh, Sunrise is amazing. And they actually, um, they're amazing for so many, uh, on so many different levels because they have really activated a lot of youth across the United States and across the world um, to care about climate change, to really push politicians and hold them accountable. Um, I personally think that they're very powerful. This is not something I've studied. So I, I keep trying to toggle between the researcher hat and Shaz the person hat. So I'm gonna put the Shaz the person hat on. Um, I actually know of some people who are super active in the organization. Um, and they've sort of both worked with Jay Inslee. They're working with the Joe Biden administration to try to again, push the climate agenda forward. So I think that that is hopeful. Um, part that, really gives me some pause is um, I think people, at least based, I mean, not thinking of Shaz the engineer hat, is that I think people may not have a really clear idea of how far we need to go when it comes to decarbonization. So people, I've still heard like people talk about 1.5 degrees based on the IPCC 1.5 degree report. And I think that people that work in the field of climate modeling and climate um, systems pretty much think that that might not happen. And so there's this range of possibilities, like a fan of possibilities. And yeah, sure, can it happen? Yeah, if we have a lot of negative emissions and a lot of um, backs, but the, the, the window of opportunity has really started to narrow for that world. It's, it's sort of wide open for the two degree to three degree world, but that's a very different world from where we are today. And so um, do those movements give me hope? Absolutely, um, especially as an academic that's relatively uncomfortable with activism. I still do activism. And that's something we can talk about as well because I think all of us, um, especially in the climate world, feel like there's enough time of sitting on the, on the sidelines. But I feel like 
we just need so much more. And I think that a lot of people might not understand how much that is, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so I think there's a related question here from Atar Herziger, um, wondering if you could speak more about how individuals should or could be empowered to charge to change the larger system. You know, is this about activism or are there other avenues that we should be trying to encourage people that are maybe under research or overlooked? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think uh, so I come from Indiana University, which is also home to Lynn Ostrom, and I see Tom Dietz, who's worked very heavily and closely with Lynn. So there's a huge power in empowering individuals to form groups that then, and you know, someone mentioned Sunrise Movement, those groups can be um, autonomous in order to push a system in a particular direction and also to self-regulate. And so I think that there... Um, so what are specific ideas? I think um, political will and public support, but what does that mean? I think demanding and understanding what the, um, so I still come from this bias of engineering. So I still feel like understanding is really important as opposed to just like skipping over understanding and just going to the change, but that's my bias. Um, I think understanding how far we need to go. And then also um, uh, the bringing out the political will. And that's what I think the Sunrise Movement, um, that's what they're doing. And I think that a lot of what they're doing actually relies on some of uh, Dietz, Bostrom-esque um, uh, methods, which are basically, um, you know, self-governance, grassroots, bringing up the power from the bottom. Uh, whether it's top down or bottom up, I think we need both. Um, and if I knew what those things were, I wouldn't you know, I'd, I'd be out there trying to do that, but I don't really know what those things actually are. And so that's for our community to sort of figure out. This is actually raising a question in my own head. Have you thought about studying politicians and their perceptions and how far they're off, not only maybe in understanding energy and climate issues, but also in understanding their own constituents. I think there's a little bit of research out there on this, but probably not enough, because there is sort of this big question of how do you bridge the gap between there's political will among the people, but then how do you actually get their political leaders to act? Um, so I'm going to call on Greg Sparkman. Uh, we are doing a project with Elke Weber and Greg to um, understand, you know, these narratives that I was talking about of where change comes from and how change actually happens, especially in the climate domain. We're sort of testing both these narratives on the public using a nationally representative sample, but then also using, I think, civic pulse to understand what um, policy and decision makers in the political world are sort of think about and compare the two, but uh, stay posted and ask Greg questions in his post session. <laughs> All right. I just whipped it to Greg, but yeah, we are, <laughs> I mean, of course, we're interested in studying that. And, and, um, and, and by the way, it's not clear that um, it's only the political elite, like there's actually in the political science, there's a there's, uh, it's an open question of whether political elite drive a lot of policy change or the public and their papers that show both. So I think that's an open question. Yeah, I think it's also a question that maybe we within psychology need to also start thinking more about as well. Um, so there was a question from Marjorie Prokash, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, aside from political partisanship, have you found any other interesting individual differences that calibrate people's reactions to climate change messengers? Yes, so what we found was surprising because we also, in, in the original paper, I think it's like 2016 or so, we also did the analysis looking at people who think climate change is very important and people who think climate change is not at all important. And what we find is that um, uh, these ad hominem type arguments work on both groups, like both people who think climate change is important and people who think climate change is not at all important have these similar findings, like the, they are sensitive to these types of, um, you know, uh, uh, communicator hip hip hypocrisy type um, uh, sentiments. And so I was surprised by that. Um, the effects are much bigger for the uh, don't believe in climate change or don't think climate change is important than people who do, but the effects were across both groups. That was surprising to me. And to Dave Krantz, which 
very little surprises Dave Kranz. Um, <laughs> and, and Matt knows this because I think Matt's also worked with Dave Kranz before. <laughs> very little Hi, Matt. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. So swinging back to uh, sort of political divisions, Mark Ferguson asked if it might be possible to merge your politics and narrative work by looking at different kinds of stories told across political divisions. Perhaps there are more individual stories journeys on the right side of the spectrum, whereas the more group stories on the left side of the spectrum. Uh, so I think kind of that sort of individualistic, maybe collective idea. Yeah, um, Mark, I'm kind of lost on this whole story angle. Like, I'm just, I've been twirling in my head for like maybe like two years now, and I've been reading stories. Um, and I'm a huge sci fi nerd, and Tom knows this because we've talked so much about sci fi. Um, and there's some sci fi, I mean, like, um, some sci fi that talks about climate narratives really beautifully, like Octavia Butler, so on and so forth. But um, I think looking at those narratives are important. But I don't know whether it's so individualistic that the story that works for me is so I it needs to be so perfectly matched to what I need, as opposed to a much more generalized story. So there's some stories that work for a lot of people because they're so popular, like Harry Potter and you know Octavia Butler. But there's some stories like I just read this interview of um, Peter Kalmus uh, in um, in uh, uh, online. And I was struck by how, like I was struck by his story. His story was really powerful about how he came to the climate activist movement. But then parts of the story really left me really troubled as well because he described how when he flies, it feels like he's flying on ground up babies and that's his words. And that to me was just like, I can't identify with that. So I shut down. And so I think, I wonder if, you know, this idea of inoculation can we have like stories that work on multiple people and what are the characteristics of that versus do we need to sort of tailor stories based on the individual? I, I don't know. I'm going to, I can just ramble on for like half an hour. It's a very tough space. It's a very tough space. And I think for any of us who have oh. done anything with vignette experiments where we're manipulating some part of a message, to, to scale that up to a story where it has all these different elements of how engaging is it and how, um, I can't remember the word they use in the literature, but how sort of absorbed you are in the story. There are so many elements that can be manipulated and it, it is a very big space, but I have faith in you that you will, you will crack it. Um, so um, Tom Dietz uh, had a comment that he appreciated your point that it's not individual change versus societal change. Both are part of the same process. As Lynn always said, government markets and communities are always intertwined. Along those lines, have you or others started work on solar radiation management, which is increasingly on the agenda of those who see little progress on decarbonization? Um, so I'm not. In fact, with, um, uh, with others, we've sort of co-authored a paper on carbon dioxide removal and like a behavioral framework on carbon dioxide removal. Um, which is sort of a very hot topic right now. Like Elon Musk said, hey, we're going to do carbon dioxide removal and we're going to have this prize. And, you know, um, same thing with Jeff Bezos and others, especially from like uh, the technocrat world. But in terms of solar radiation management, I haven't, like I'm kind of um, personally, and again, this is Shaz, both the individual and the engineer I had on, it makes me kind of, like geoengineering makes me feel a little nervous, but I think we need to study it. And David Keith and others, um, and I've spoken to them and read a lot of their work, they're working very hard to try to figure out what are methods of geoengineering that might be safer rather than less safe, you know, and what the whole spectrum looks like. Um, I haven't looked at that as yet, or like looked at risk perceptions. Others have, and they're doing like an amazing job of it, but it makes me feel uh, somewhat uh, hesitant and nervous. So I'm sort of, um, putting my own energies into mitigation and adaptation as opposed to um, solar radiation management. But it's, I think it's it, like, as an engineer, it's like amazing and completely terrifying. <laughs> like, it's and both amazing. I mean, like, part of me is just like, holy cow, we can like do this for the entire earth and we can like release like particles into the stratosphere, like at, you know, at the equator and they're going to migrate. And like, it's just like sci-fi, you know? But part of me is like, holy, 
crap, we have one earth and what happens, you know, anyways. And you're an engineer. So when you imagine the public's response of, of thinking about that, it's probably even more frightened and, and I'm actually- not sure, actually, I don't know whether um, they think of uh, geoengineering more as nuclear or more as like, yeah, we do that all the time and that's okay, you know? Um, because I was talking to someone about Freakonomics and how they had a chapter about geoengineering and how they were like, yeah, it's a great simple back pocket solution. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, anyhow, my own bias. Yeah, well, I, I will pipe up there if anyone's interested. Caitlin and I have done some work on the carbon dioxide removal part, and there does seem to be an element of if you perceive it tampers with nature, you are less supportive of it. So, but that's a whole other world to dive into. Um, so we have a question from Lisa Nas Cook. What are some of the reasons conservatives and liberals are similarly neutral on nuclear energy? Um, can you speak to any trends on changing perceptions of advanced nuclear reactors when considering alternatives to hydropower on rivers in the Western US where salmon are highly vulnerable to climate change? Um, so these are averages across a very large population. Um, and that's why I think they were relatively like flatlined, both liberals and conservatives are neutral in um, nuclear. I think um, we did not, you know, specify, we just said nuclear energy based on like traditional nuclear, not like small modular reactors or new nuclear technology. Um, I think the, why that is the case, I think in general, I'm not sure why they were neutral as opposed to, I would have expected them to be um, less supportive on nuclear given a lot of the work done by Paul Slovic and others on risk perceptions related to nuclear energy, which is even though quite dated, it still applies today. And, it, and is sort of replicating in the trend with both Germany and Japan moving away from nuclear um, after Fukushima. Um, so I don't really, we haven't, again, this is like the bird eye view. We don't know what the guts of the of that particular question really look at. Um, if you're asking personally, do I think nuclear is needed in the energy mix? I would say most likely yes. And there's been sort of a huge debate in the energy climate world about whether we need to be 100% wind, water, solar, which is Mark Jacobson et al. And then uh, Christopher Clack et al. talking about how we really need nuclear in that mix because we need to be able to provide a stable base load. Um, and I think if you were to ask me uh, personally, as a, a sort of someone who's read that literature where I fall, I would say that we probably need nuclear um, based on you know, the papers that I've read out of both of those camps. Um, but that doesn't really answer sort of very specifically what's happening in terms of small modular reactors. That's something I don't really know as yet, but there's probably literature out there. Thank you. Or it's a research opportunity. I'm actually not sure that there is either. I've, I've looked a little bit. Um, I'm going to, uh, we'll do one more question from Ash Gillis, and then I think we're actually running a little bit ahead of time, but then we can do the breakout room. I don't want you to have to answer questions endlessly. <laughs> so um, Ash asked, well, first commented that your work on public perceptions of energy use is fascinating. Are there other attributes of energy behavior besides the quantifiable impact that you think are important for increasing behavioral engagement? So um, here's something controversial and it completely sort of discounts a lot of the research we've done is I'm actually not sure how important it is to get the estimates right. I've spent like a whole decade studying like, you know, how do people estimate how much energy different appliances use? And now I'm sort of of the mind that perhaps we need to get them in the right ballpark using these heuristics um, and then just effectively motivate. And so there've been a lot of studies, not done by us, but by others looking at social norms, dynamic norms, um, using social comparisons of your neighbor. And this is work done by Hunt Alcott investigating O Power and WaterSmart um, that are effective, but they're in the ballpark of two to 3% a reduction of energy and water use um, relative to each other. And so, I think that those are important uh, parts, but that's not gonna get us how far we need to get, which is this huge system-wide change. So then the question that I have to ask our community is that, all right, you know, GM said they're going to only stop, they're gonna stop working on these older technologies for transportation and they're gonna to move towards electric vehicles. What would it take in terms of the social sciences 
to sort of shift all of our vehicles in our current fleet to all electric vehicles like in the next five years. And that's like a huge and interesting question that requires both the merging of engineering and social psychology and cognitive science and a variety of other fields. But I think that those are really effective questions where we need to, again, think of how individuals are embedded in this larger system. But do we need to get people accurate on like these numbers? I don't think so. I think at least my personal views have changed since, thank God that they've changed in the last decade. <laughs> Um, because I think that the heuristics can get us pretty close and we use heuristics all the time. Um, so that's kind of where I come at, Ash, if that answers your question. Okay, so this is prompting one last question for me. Yeah. Knowing that you're in a school of public affairs, do you have thoughts on how we should best get these heuristics into the hands of people so that they can actually use them? Um, so we still need to test which ones are effective, right? So that's one of the things that we're doing right now, which permutation combinations of these expert heuristics that we've identified are effective. Um, then the question is, how do you get them in the right hands? Uh, I don't know, like, I think that that's actually an area where our lab has not done very well. Like we've created tools and we just, again, like, you know, as an engineer, I'm like, oh, you know, you build it, they'll come. <laughs> Just, but that's not the case. We built this really cool, to me, a water system game that teaches people about how the water system works because we had 500 students draw the water system. And a lot of the drawings were like, magic happens in this clean water. And so we said, all right, you know, maybe we need to explain to people why or how the water system works. And there's nothing like virgin water because people are very hesitant to drink recycled water. And so we built the game but then we didn't really think through how to bring it to the masses. And I think that that's a question for people in marketing or potentially um, social influencers, but I'm far from that. Like, I think we need to sort of, again, we need a better landscape fabric or social fabric to help pass the buck to other, to other groups that are really good at doing that. Yeah, and it's probably something that we as social scientists need to figure out better who those people are. Um, as part of our engagement. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule, but I think in order to actually have a break before the next session, we're gonna open up a breakout room for you, Shaz, and anyone, if you wanna go meet face-to-face, -face, like approaching after the podium, you are welcome to do that. And we will reconvene at 20 past the hour, but if you can all again, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Shazina Tari. And thank you all for letting me walk you through so much, so many uh, pieces of data. That was a lot of fun. All right, so I think we're going to get started with our first panel session. I'm Lexi and I'm going to be moderating. The theme of this session is collective action. And just a few notes, we're going to be saving all of the questions until after the third speaker. So you can go ahead and put them in the chat as they, as they come up, but we'll just do them at the end. And we probably won't be able to do like raising your hand for this just um, for time. So put them in the chat box. And again, there'll be a Q&A like breakout room after the session is over. So you'll be able to choose to join one of the speakers uh, breakout rooms if you'd like. Um, so we can get started with the first speaker who is Duraine Green. She's an assistant professor at Indiana University Bloomington. And her talk is on lessons from Flint, emotion regulation, moral outrage, and solidarity based collective action. So, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here as part of this um, pre conference and this session. And I'm also really excited to present my work on the implications of managing emotions for feelings of moral outrage and solidarity-based collective action in the context of the Flint water crisis. So the Flint water crisis was precipitated by a cost-cutting measure to switch Flint's water source from the Detroit water system to the inadequately treated um, and also corrosive Flint River. Government officials 
failed to intervene for months while the Flint River water corroded lead-based pipes in Flint that in turn leached poisonous lead into the water of Flint residents. So communities of color and low-income communities are disproportionately affected by various forms of social injustices, including environmental injustice like what occurred in Flint. It's important therefore to investigate factors that may shape engagement in social action on behalf of members of these groups. So in today's talk, I consider the role of moral outrage in shaping willingness to engage in social action on behalf of Flint res residents. And I consider the role of moral outrage in shaping social action among those who are not directly impacted by this environmental injustice. So experiences and perceptions of injustice often trigger feelings of moral outrage. And moral outrage can be elicited when a third party, such as the government or corporation, are deemed responsible for the injustice faced by a disadvantaged group. Furthermore, moral outrage often emerges in response to a third party's moral transgressions or illegitimate actions that violate moral standards of fairness and justice. When injustice occurs, people who are bystanders, so those who do not live in the unjust conditions and are not necessarily responsible for perpetuating the injustice, can act in concert with those harmed by engaging in solidarity-based collective action. For example, sustained media attention brought the Flint water crisis to the national spotlight, leading people who are not directly impacted by, the, by this event um, to donate water bottles and donate money on behalf of Flint residents. And extant work demonstrates that moral outrage about an injustice predicts willingness to engage in collective action to reduce the harms faced um, by the victims. So solidarity-based collective action motivated by moral outrage involves efforts to redress the injustices faced by a disadvantaged group and to hold third parties accountable for their actions. Understanding the factors that shape or perhaps dampen moral outrage is needed to predict the extent to which bystanders will engage in solidarity-based collective action. And we propose that key emotion regulation strategies can be leveraged to shape moral outrage, which can in turn modulate solidarity-based collective action. So what is emotion regulation? Emotion regulation involves controlled or automatic processes by which individuals influence which emotions they have, when they have them and how they experience and express these emotions. And there are many strategies that people can use to manage their emotions. But for today's talk, I will largely focus on um, two strategies, immersion, which is a constant reliving of an event from a first person perspective, and distance reappraisal, which involves reflecting on events from a detached or um, objective perspective. And I specifically consider the differential effects of these strategies when people are reflecting on the Flint water crisis. When individuals use an immersed coping strategy, they focus on events from a first person point of view. This can lead to rumination, which is characterized by a constant reliving of an event from a first person perspective. And previous work has shown that immersed coping tends to amplify psychological and physiological distress. So when it comes to emotions in particular, it tends to lead to or maintain more negative emotions. On the other hand, when people use a distance um, emotion regulation strategy, or they engage in distance reappraisal, they focus on negative events from a third person point of view. So this tends to promote adaptive self-reflection and relative to immersion, it's associated with more positive physiological and emotional well being. For example, work has shown that engaging in distance reappraisal compared to immersion tends to reduce feelings of anger. Distance reappraisal and immersion have divergent effects on collective action. For example, Ford and colleagues found that the use of reappraisal strategies by Democrats to manage negative emotions elicited by the 2016 US presidential election was related to a lower likelihood of engaging in political action. So doing things like donating money or volunteering time. In contrast, engaging in immersion in response to group-based discrimination is associated with greater intentions um, or greater negative emotions and in turn greater intentions to engage in collective action to combat discrimination. 
So taken together, this research suggests that the effects of emotion regulation strategies extend beyond individual level affect, also impacting group level outcomes, such as engagement in collective action. So the present work builds on and extends this previous work by examining the role of immersion and distance reappraisal in shaping feelings of moral outrage and solidarity-based collective action among bystanders when, when reflecting on the um, Flint water crisis. In order to first um, test this question, in the first study, we recruited 361 participants from cloud research. And participants watched an approximately five minute video um, news clip that included information about the Flint, Michigan water crisis and also included a diverse group of residents describing their experiences contending with it. Participants were then randomly assigned to watch the video under one of three conditions as a proxy for emotion regulation. So people who were in the immersion condition were given perspective taking instructions. Specifically, they were asked to take the perspective of Flint, Michigan residents in the video by imagining that you were one of them and consider how you would think, feel and behave if you were in the same situation. On the other hand, people in the distance reappraisal condition were given objective focus um, instructions and they were told to remain objective as you watch the video by imagining you are an impartial judge watching a court case or a journalist who must simply pay attention to the facts. And in the third condition, it was a no instructions control condition. So participants were not provided any instruction about how to watch or process the video. They were simply asked to watch it. Participants were then asked to indicate how they experienced a range of emotions and four items were aggregated to form a composite measure of moral outrage. So following previous work, um, participants rated the extent to which they felt angry, irritated, outraged, or hostile when thinking about the Flint water crisis. Finally, participants um, completed measures of solidarity based collective action intentions and they were asked, for example, to indicate the extent to which they would participate in some form of collective action to help Flint, Michigan residents. So to orange to the graph or to the graph that I'll be presenting next, the higher scores for here represent greater um, or more moral outrage and for the solidarity based collective action graph, it represents greater intentions to engage in collective action. And I predicted here that people who were in the distance reappraisal condition, they would report less moral outrage compared to those in the immersion and those in the control condition. And similarly, they would be le more likely to express less interest in engaging in solidarity-based collective action compared to those who are in the immersion condition and control condition. And consistent with predictions, um, participants in the distance reappraisal condition reported experiencing less moral outrage compared with participants in the immersion condition and those who are in the no instructions control condition. And there were no significant differences between participants in the immersion condition and those in the control condition. And similarly for participants' solidarity-based collective action intentions, Participants who were in the distance reappraisal condition, they reported um, less willingness or less interest in engaging in solidarity-based collective action compared to those who were in the immersion condition and those who were in the control condition. And again, there were no significant differences between those in the immersion condition and those in the control condition. We used a multi-categorical mediator model to examine whether there would be an indirect effect of emotion regulation condition on participants' um, collective action intentions via their feelings of moral outrage. And here we examined two comparisons. So D1 was um, distance reappraisal versus immersion, and D2 was distance reappraisal versus control. And we did this since our um, predictor had more than two levels. So first starting with moral outrage, so consistent with um, predictions and what I just showed you, participants in the distance reappraisal condition compared to those in the immerse condition and those in the control condition reported less moral outrage. And moral outrage in turn was related to um, greater intentions to engage in solidarity-based collective action. And because both indirect effects were significant, this suggests that people in the distance reappraisal condition relative to those in the immersion condition and those in the control condition 
might be less likely to engage in collective action because it's associated with reduced moral outrage. So together, these analyses suggest that relative to participants in the immersion condition and those in the no instructions control condition, those in the um, distance reappraisal condition indicated a lo lower solidarity based collective action intentions due to their reduced feelings of moral outrage. We conducted study two in order to replicate and extend the findings from study one. So here we again recruited 392 participants from cloud research. They watched a brief news clip about the Flint water crisis using one of two perspectives or with no instructions. And they were asked to list their thoughts for four minutes. Participants again completed measures of moral outrage and also a measure of solidarity based collective action. New to this study, we gave participants a $1 bonus and we asked them to consider making a donation to the United Way of Genesee County Flint Water Fund. So specifically, we asked them how much of their dollar they would be willing to donate to this water fund. Again, um, higher scores um, in the following graphs represent um, greater feelings of moral outrage, greater intentions to engage in solidarity-based collective action and also higher willingness to donate. And we again predicted that participants in the distance reappraisal condition would report um, less moral outrage and also less solidarity-based collective action intentions. And new to this study, we predicted that participants in the distance reappraisal condition would be less willing to make a donation compared to those who were in the immersion condition and those in the control condition. So con consistent with predictions and with the study one findings, we again found that participants in the distance reappraisal condition reported feeling less moral outrage compared to those in the immersion condition and those in the control condition. However, um, for solidarity-based collective action intentions, contrary to predictions, um, analyses reveal no significant effects on this measure. And um, we also didn't find any significant effects for um, participants' willingness to donate. Although we did not find a significant main effect um, for emotion regulation on collective action intentions or willingness to donate, we again used a multi-categorical mediator model to examine whether um, there would be an indirect effect of emotion regulation condition on participants' um, collective action intentions and willingness to donate via their feelings of moral outrage. So again, replicating pre the previous findings, we found that those in the distance reappraisal condition compared to those in the immersion condition and those in the control conditions reporting feeling less moral outrage. Moral outrage, again, was related to um, increased solidarity-based collective action intentions. And both indirect effects were significant again here. And we also found a similar um, finding or similar pattern for willingness to make a donation. So because both sets of indirect effects were significant, this suggests that people in, again, that people in the distance reappraisal relative to those in the immersion condition and control conditions might be less likely to engage um, in collective action or thus willing to make a donation because it's associated again with reduced moral outrage. So the results revealed overall that distance reappraisal versus immersion and a no instructions control condition reduced fe people's feelings of moral outrage. However, the palliative effects of distance reappraisal on these affective experiences might dampen the fuel necessary to fight for social change. Taken together, this research suggests that emotion regulation strategies that increase or sustain so-called negative emotions such as moral outrage can boost intentions to engage in collective action, while strategies that reduce said negative emotions can dampen them. Thus, those who want to maintain motivation for collective action should do what they can to combat disengagement or, distant, or engagement in distance reappraisal. So I'd like to thank my wonderful collaborators and acknowledge our funding and thank you for listening. Thank you, Duraine.
so our next speaker is Kirsten Thorson. She is an associate professor at Michigan State University. And her talk is entitled Committed Participation or Flash Years of Action, Mobilizing Public Attention to Climate on Twitter. So let's get, Kirsten, if you wanna start sharing your slides, perfect. And then we'll change the pin. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you all. I'm excited to be part of this pre-conference and thank you to Kim for the invitation. Um, so I am a political communication scholar. My level of analysis is gonna be a little different than some of the other things you've heard today. Um, and I study social media and politics. I'm interested in the ways in which political messages or messages about politicized issues reach people um, and the sort of complexities through which those messages reach people, particularly in the context of our insanely complicated digital media environment that we all inhabit. So for me, one of the places in which I ask those kinds of questions is about attention to climate change. What is public attention to the climate issue? Where does it come from? What shapes does it take? Through which venues do messages reach people that increase their likelihood that they would care about them or that they'll be mobilized? And so what I'm gonna do is talk to you for the next few minutes about a couple of studies that we've done as part of that broader agenda that are really more about the structure of engagement on one particular platform that is Twitter and the ways in which we can maybe think about Twitter as well as other social media platforms as part of the broader engine of generation of attention to, to the climate issue in particular. And so I'll start the story with the power of attention, attention itself, that, that it's very important that theoretically we think of attention as an actual resource for social movements, for advocacy organizations. It is through gaining attention typically that these types of organizations are able to advance their agendas or influence public opinion, policy opinion, elite opinion by showing mass support as been referenced in a couple of the earlier presentations today. And we know from some research on climate advocacy organizations and, and with activists that there's an increasing emphasis on trying to gain sustained public motivation to uh, attention to climate as a strategy on social media. And not just like, you know, sort of a little bit of attention, but sustained committed engagement from climate issue publics, right? The segments that we know are concerned, they're knowledgeable, and they're alarmed about the potential effects of climate change. Unfortunately, in the digital media environment, a lot of the elements and, and characteristics of social media platforms, as all of you know, sort of instinctively, uh, tend to produce bursts of attention that feel in very much like fireworks. Things flame into the public eye and then they often disappear just as quickly. Think about the ice bucket challenge. Um, but you can also take sort of an issue cycle thinking about the lifespan of any issue and the ways in which bursts of attention seem to emerge sometimes almost out of nowhere and then disappear. And as a result of this, there's a lot of existing debate that I'm sure many of you have heard of as to whether or not expressive engaged behaviors on social media do they really even matter? Should we think of it as slacktivism or sort of you know, low cost forms of, of, of engagement that don't really matter? And so the studies that I'm gonna to talk to you about today really started from that perspective, from saying, what if maybe there's some possibility that these bursts of attention, these flashes of engagement actually do have some sort of real world impact or could make a difference? How could we look for that um, in, in sort of existing data and tell a different story about what we see happening in these spaces? So the, the sort of the, the competing set of possibilities that we're wrestling with in these studies, uh, we've described as sort of the moments possibility or the movements possibility. So the more optimistic take on what we might find is that if we look at people engaging with the climate issue on social media, on Twitter specifically, over a period of time, maybe what we'll see is that each one of these flashes is sort of a repeated activation of a growing network of people who really, really care deeply. And what we're seeing is something being actually built. So that's the movements possibility. And there's a lot of reasons theoretically in understanding issue publics um, and as well as sort of the, the structures and dynamics of social movements to think that might be possible. On the other hand, the less optimistic version of this would be that the flashes of attention that we see from people on Twitter are really just flashes of attention, right? You woke up one morning, your friend said something, you retweeted it, and that was it, you're out, you're done. It's not about being passionate or being part of an issue public, it's just the sort of messiness of social media. So just to give you a sense of what Twitter conversation on um, climate looks like, this is the time period that we cover in the two studies that I'll be talking to you about briefly today, um, 2011 to 2015. As you can see here, this is just a chart of the volume, it's actually based on volume by day of, of tweets that mention climate 
over that time period. And you can see what looks like growth punctuated by these bursts of attention. So those spikes are high volume days, big events that sort of sparked that sort of intense attention to the climate issue. It looks like growth, and in fact, it is growth. It's actually pretty substantial growth. The growth of, of the volume of conversation about climate on Twitter is much larger than the growth of the user base of Twitter itself um, by a substantial amount. So we do see some optimistic possibilities that more and more people at least are talking about this space. But why use Twitter as this particular lens? And this is something that we get asked a lot about this project. And in general, my work is about lots of different platforms and sort of the ways in which attention and visibility of issues and messages arcs across platforms. But Twitter is really important, not because of the public that is on there. Only about 22% of US adults use Twitter. And most of those actually rarely tweet. For those of you who are on Twitter, you know instinctively that many of the tweets that you see come from a very small number of people. But we're interested in Twitter not because it's public opinion, it's not, but rather because what happens on Twitter has an outside influence on things that have an even bigger shaping effect on public opinion. That is the mainstream news media and other forms of coverage. So we know this from other domains, uh, Donald Trump in the run up to the 2016 election, great evidence to suggest that his Twitter behavior absolutely shaped and predicted news coverage. We see similar things with analysis of Black Lives Matter activists use of Twitter, which also predicts news media attention as well as elite policy attention. And then one of my own students finished a dissertation just last year showing really in some really interesting ways how attention to the climate issue in particular on Twitter also predicts news media coverage, as well as search behavior. So sort of more individual level behavior of, of that might reflect an interest or attention to the issue. Okay, so let's get back to the big question. So we have these two possibilities. One, there's all these sort of climate, climate issue public out there and active public that could be, coming, be becoming a more engaged uh, and, and sort of attentive, active social movement like body. Or it could be that bursts of attention on social media really do reflect moments of ad hoc publics. That is sort of temporary assemblages of people who almost at random just sort of manage to tweet about, about Twitter. And that would manage to tweet about climate. And that would be a sadder outcome, of course, because we're hoping to see this sort of growth and, and, and building of an actual movement. Uh, you can think of it like this is the same chart again, but now what we're looking at empirically here in a second are these spikes themselves. That is, if the moments, if the movement's hypothesis is correct, then we would expect to see people start to appear in the early spikes of attention coming back in later spikes of attention, suggesting that there has some sort of sustained engagement over time. So the data that we're using are tweets. Um, we have there's about 45 million, almost 46 million tweets about climate uh, between 2011 and, and the end of 2015. But what we're going to do in this study is zoom in on 12 particular events. And if you want to talk in the q and I can show you what events they are. But they're high volume events that produced a lot of attention, at least by our metrics on Twitter, including a uh, couple IPCC reports, People's Climate March, uh, the Pope's encyclical, and other events that had uh, a big influence on people paying attention to the climate issue. And essentially what we're going to do is just track users across the events using a series of different analyses. So I'll show you that first. And this is if we were a live audience, I would say, hey, what do you think is going to happen? Moments or movements. And if you were like the people we've talked to about this before, you would probably be fairly split and each side would think the other side is, is an impossibility or at least that they were wrong. But the results are very, very clear. The moments hypothesis or the moments possibility uh, much better describes our data than this idea of a growing social movement. In fact, the vast majority of user accounts in our data set tweet only one time across these 12 events. It's almost impossible to see so little repetition uh, in, in a set of events that are so closely related to each other. So about three quarters of the user accounts appear only once. Only about 6% of user accounts tweet at least three events. And the average overlap of users between any two events is like about 7%. And that number does not change when the events are similar to each other, when they're close together in geographic location, close together in time, those overlaps look about the same size. And so initially, I think there's one way to tell the story, this is kind of a depressing story, that it's completely meaningless. There's, we're not able to detect sort of a, a, a set of a growing movement of people who are attentive and engaged to the climate issue on social media. But that's not the end of the story because we also find what we're calling serial participants, repeat uh, participants in this conversation. 1,371 accounts is so small that tweeted in all 11 or 12 of our high attention events. They're just 0.14% of all of the unique users in our data set. 
And we've looked pretty closely at them. They're mostly individuals, about two thirds are just individuals. Um, the other third is media, uh, large, large and small climate advocacy organizations, professional associations, scientific associations. And among those individuals, most of them are actually regular people. Um, so people with not that many followers, but who do a lot of tweeting and who in particular do a lot of tweeting about the climate issue. The really cool thing about serial participants, and I think there's a few of them, but one of the really cool things about these serial participants is emerging sets of studies that use similar methods to ours across many different topics over the last couple of years have started to see these serial participants or serial activists emerge as the backbone of lots of different activist or, or, or advocacy issues. Occupy movement, the vinegar protests in Ignatos, the Black Lives Matter movement, you see very similar patterns of the sort of really strong core. And we start to look a little bit closer at this core. This is just a network of the serial participants, these 1,370 accounts, um, and the way they mention each other on Twitter. And for those of you who aren't Twitter users, if you can mention, it's kind of like you just say somebody else's account name or they can say something back to you. It's a way of sort of um, acknowledging someone or, or, or drawing attention, drawing someone else's attention to, to you. And the accounts that you see at the top are the ones that get the most mentions in this network. And those are things you've heard of, right? Like, uh, EcoWatch, Climate Progress, The Guardian, Al Gore, for example, Politico, these are the more sort of elite accounts within this space. As you head toward the bottom, these are the accounts that are sending out most of those mentions. And these tend to be people you haven't heard of or who are just climate Twitter famous, if that's actually a thing, I'm not sure that's a thing, but we could make it a thing. And these are accounts that tend to be sort of strategically maneuvering regular people who are doing a lot of tweeting and building a lot of connections among other people in this network. So in another study um, that I'm just going to mention very briefly in passing before I wrap up, we wanted to really dig in and think about, in, in theory, theoretically speaking, who are these serial participants? And with my colleagues um, conducting a longitudinal network analysis to really try to understand how over time, this small network of people who care deeply about the climate issue, although some are anti, um, how they change over time, do they become closer together? How are they maneuvering in this space? But then more importantly, how does that small core shape the dynamics of the broader sort of ad hoc publics that get assembled around these high attention events? And what we see is that over time, our serial participants are becoming more and more important in the overall networks of people tweeting about climate. They're increasingly connected with elites in the network. They do really cool things that I think the, the way that I like to think about it is they act as stitchers or knitters to bring all of these disparate frames, disparate ideas, disparate feelings that different fe that people and accounts are bringing to this issue. They find ways to bring them together under umbrella hashtags, under sort of other structural mechanisms that they use inside the platform. And ultimately they're increasingly brokers of relationships within this larger network. So in some, you can see them as sort of increasingly central and influential uh, in this overall online mobilization, which is like the, the happy side of the overall sadness to the seeing the sort of overall, it's a moments, it's the moments explanation that does most of the work. So in closing, what are the implications of some of this work? Um, one, if someone tells you there's a huge and growing activist issue public on Twitter, uh, I'm not sure that that's the case, at least not in the data that we have, or at least not up until 2015, maybe it's magically happening in, in, the, in the years since. But that we really need to understand Twitter attention to climate as this sort of core tight knit, maybe even loosely strategic community of practice surrounded by a very casual periphery of people who are not super, super invested. And that teeny tiny core actually does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of articulating and making sense of that messy periphery and knitting it together in some sense. And the cool thing is that this is actually a very classic structure of offline environmental movements. It's very typical to see this sort of hard core of activists surrounded by a, a mobilizable external set of publics. The difference is on Twitter, the, that, that external periphery might be fundamentally different people from event to event, which makes it a much more complex thing to understand. And the thing I want to leave with, and I think it's been really interesting just hearing the keynote in the, in the first presentation, are the ways in which this is a very different way, I think, of looking at the climate issue than, you know, some of the, the presentations we've heard today. But I think it's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in this sort of the small data set that lives within this large data set to think about interdisciplinary approaches to help understand that sort of bridge between the sort of the policy level, the public opinion level, and the sort of individual level concerns about behavior. Why 
what motivates these people? Why do they work so hard? What are the frames that become articulated because of the ways they help to stitch together? Um, they stitch together these sort of loose, messy looking uh, giant sets of people tweeting about climate. So thank you all very much for having me and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other talks today. Great, thank you, Kirsten. Our final speaker in this panel is Lorraine Whitmarsh, and she's a professor of environmental psychology at the University of Bath. Her talk is entitled Lessons from COVID-19 for Mobilizing Climate Action. Thank you very much indeed. It's really great to be joining you. Um, and hopefully you can see my slides here. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. I want to be actually thinking about uh, the links between uh, what we've been experiencing for the last uh, several months and uh, climate change, which is uh, what I uh, spend my life studying. Um, okay, hold on. And it may seem like a lifetime ago, but about 12 months ago, a lot of global attention was focused on the Australian bushfires and these very powerful images that we saw in the media of um, fires raging across Australia, causing enormous amounts of damage, um, destruction and, uh, uh, and death. And this served as a really powerful um, image of what climate change can do and how significant a risk um, it is for many people. Um, within just a few weeks, many of us were plunged into lockdown and we were experiencing uh, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, we have been uh, doing so for many months since then. Um, and these two issues, climate change and COVID-19, of course, are very different issues in, in many ways, but there are some parallels and similarities that they share. They're both, of course, global issues, um, and they both require individuals to significantly change their behavior and act for the common good. So, you know, stay at home in order to protect uh, protect other people, wear a mask to protect um, other people, etc. Um, and similarly for climate change, reduce your emissions in order to um, consider the impact on the planet. They require government intervention in lifestyles and um, we know there's increasing evidence to show that we need a lot of behavioural change in order to tackle climate change, technology alone won't do it. Um, and similarly, of course, we've needed to change our behaviour very drastically and significantly for COVID. I think both issues also maybe challenge our ideas about societal resilience. So we may have thought um, that actually our way of life was quite secure and stable, but actually it's really called into question what we can take for granted and, and just how safe we are, I think. And, and I think climate change is starting to do that uh, it, for many people too. Um, and they do, uh, the two issues do share some common causes and solutions. So um, encroachment into biodiversity and uh, into ecosystems, uh, they are, they are um, partially uh, causes of both uh, issues. And of course, solution-wise, uh, the less we travel, uh, the less we can spread COVID and uh, the, uh, we can also help to reduce our emissions. In fact, one silver lining um, from the pandemic, which of course has been horrific in so many ways, is that our emissions have dropped. So during 2020, we've seen about a 7% global drop in CO2 emissions, mostly due to travel restrictions. So it's mostly come from the transport sector, but also to some extent from other sectors. Um, so we've been doing less, so our emissions have gone down. Um, and, and a sort of, and a second silver lining, if we can think about it uh, that way, is that because we've had to very drastically change what we've been doing in the last few months, it has caused many people to kind of think about, well, do we want to go back to society as, as the way it was, or do we want to build back better? Um, do we want to have a green recovery? Do we want to have a more equitable society? So it's actually caused people to think about what is important and maybe we can actually recover um, in a more sustainable way than we had uh, before, but I think importantly, um, the idea of a green recovery and actually addressing climate change, we can do that in a way that is more planned than we were able to do with COVID. So that was a very sudden disruption, um, whereas hopefully we can actually do things in a more planned way for climate change. 
Of course, the two issues are not the same. While they have some similarities, they are very different in many ways. And maybe most obviously, climate change is not as tangible and maybe not as emotive um, for many people as COVID. So for most of us, we know people who have contracted COVID, maybe even who have sadly died. We may have had it ourselves. We can just look around us and see the impact of the restrictions. Um, so it's very real. It's very visible and tangible to, uh, to virtually everybody. Um, whereas climate change is an issue which we know from many studies people kind of see as psychologically quite distant, that it's something that affects other people, other species, future generations, people in other countries, etc. So it's not, for many people at least, um, it, it isn't quite as uh, tangible. Um, climate change is also something which probably for many people, they feel less self-efficacy to reduce the risk. In other words, they can't just stay home, wash their hands, etc., to minimise exposure to, uh, to it. So in the same way that with climate change, what we need is for everybody to be taking action. So as individuals, we can't necessarily control our exposure to the risk. Um, so yeah, so arguably lower self-efficacy uh, for climate change. And um, I would say certainly lower social norms to act in response to it. So while we can certainly think about there being people who um, flout COVID restrictions, um, actually in most countries, compliance with restrictions are pretty high. I mean, in the UK, it's been consistently um, well over 80%. Um, and yet we know that for climate change, actually to have a really low carbon lifestyle is not socially normative. It's not, a, it's not a normal thing as such. It's not necessarily what people aspire to. Whereas usually in many countries, at least high consumption lifestyles is what people tend to aspire towards and what, which is relatively normal. So we have a way to go to change norms. And we also could say that the solutions to tackle climate change are probably more ambiguous. We can't just have like a three word um, slogan like hand space space as we do in, uh, in the UK to tackle COVID. We don't have that kind of very clear, what you can do is this, and that's um, it's as simple as that. Um, similarly, we don't have as much, I think, political mandate to intervene for climate change for, the, for these very reasons. It's not as tangible. People are not as concerned necessarily. Um, and also the changes required to tackle climate change are uh, longer term and, and arguably permanent. So actually we need to completely transform our society to be low carbon and, and resilient to climate impacts. Whereas the reason that we're locked down at the moment is on the understanding that at some point we'll be able to go back to hopefully some level of um, freedom and, and normality. Um, so the acceptance of these restrictions is greater because it's seen as temporary. Whereas with climate change, we'll expect people to change their behavior in the longer term. So that means it's harder to get people to act on climate change than it has been to date on, on COVID. And of course, there are things we can do to reduce this gap so that, so that making climate change more tangible. So, and we can do that partly through communication and information provision. So we can give people information which appeals to their values, for example, through segmentation. We can actually uh, target people who maybe have greener values and say, um, this is this is good for the environment, and, and therefore we, we would know that those sorts of messages would play better to people that have green values. Um, we can also actually identify um, more tangible benefits that actually would have much broader appeal. So not segmenting and identifying different groups that have different values, but actually thinking, well, probably most people would be interested in saving money or improving their health or maybe having more free time or their, their family's well-being and health, et cetera. So actually those co-benefits, those side benefits to uh, taking climate action are probably the sorts of things that we can do to have broader appeal and motivate people to change their behavior um, rather than focusing maybe just on the emissions and the environmental benefits. And in this way, we can make taking climate change action more tangible by actually focusing on some of these more immediate benefits that people could experience um, from things like you know, active travel, walking to work and so on. At the same time, I've mentioned we need to change norms, we need to build self-efficacy. And again, we can do that through um, social and informational approaches. We can show people that um, people like you, people like them, are taking action uh, to tackle climate change, to reduce their emissions. 
and maybe that they have those tangible benefits I've just mentioned, like lower energy bills. Um, and we have schemes like open house where you can actually go into um, neighbours who maybe have some sort of low carbon installation and actually have a look at what they're doing and see actually this is really easy to install, it's really beneficial, somebody like me is doing it. So you kind of start to change norms that way. And of course we can use social norm messaging, uh, which have been very widely used in social psychology to change behaviour, encouraging people to change their um, travel habits, for example, um, by pointing to the fact that um, a growing number of their colleagues or peers uh, are starting to use more low carbon modes of travel. Of course, we also need wider change to remove barriers to behaviour change. And um, this image comes from a very recent uh, United, United Nations Environment Programme report, the Emissions Gap Report, uh, where there was a chapter on how to achieve lifestyle change for uh, tackling climate change. And it pointed out that information alone will not do it. We need broader structural change, changes in regulations, incentives, etc. And of course, social and contextual changes. We need to involve people. We need to change those norms and have interpersonal influence that changes um, the social context too. So all of these things together, then we can kind of enable and, and motivate people to change their behavior um, in a way that we've not um, yet seen uh, sufficient action to do. One final thing on, on lifestyle changes of that we also need to get the timing right for when we intervene. So we know that habits are a really major barrier to lifestyle change and particularly for interventions that rely on information um, and those sort of softer measures. Um, they tend not to be effective when people have strong habits, but there are times when habits are disrupted. And in a number of studies, they've looked at, for example, moving house as one, uh, one time when habits become weaker um, and, and disrupted. And so they've shown, for example, in uh, one study from a number of years ago, uh, uh, led by Bamberg, that if you give people information and a one day pass to try the local bus service, um, if you give that to people who have pre-existing travel habits, it tends not to be effective. But if you give it to people when they've very recently moved house, the habits are disrupted, they're interested in how best to get to their workplace uh, from their new home. And that, that intervention is, has been shown to be very effective. So from 18% to 47% in uh, rise in bus use. So when you intervene really matters. So times of disruption provide really good opportunities to intervene more effectively. And then I guess this may mean that COVID-19 is um, one such opportunity to actually promote sustainable lifestyles. We've seen enormous amounts of disruption uh, in society, probably you know, not seen since the Second World War um, in our lifestyles. And so we know from our studies, for example, lockdown disruption has created a number of low carbon um, habits. So obviously working from home and traveling less, but also saving energy and water at home, definitely saving, um, sorry, reducing food waste, um, and also undertaking a number of low carbon habits. So more gardening, reading, etc. And while a lot of people have not enjoyed many of those imposed um, changes on our lifestyle, actually our studies show that there are aspects of those changes that people have enjoyed and they have enjoyed the sort of maybe slower pace of life or um, cooking for themselves, et cetera, um, and seen some benefits of reduced travel. But the key question is whether those changes that we've seen during lockdown will re uh, remain in the longer term and whether they will actually become durable habits. And that really depends on whether those changes are locked in with appropriate infrastructure, incentives, norms, et cetera, all those things I've just shown um, to be important components of changing lifestyles. Um, and so while we do have some you know, emerging kind of infrastructure changes within city centers and, uh, and so on to encourage people to um, adopt, adopt active travel um, behaviors during lockdown, if those are not maintained in the longer term, then the habits that we've started to see people adopting will not uh, remain. But the good news is that actually we do have pretty good support in, in many countries for those sorts of changes because actually our studies, but also US studies and elsewhere have shown that climate change concern has not been dented by COVID-19. So 
Uh, we predicted maybe that um, people would be less worried about climate change over the last few months, but in fact, concern about climate change has risen during 2020 uh, from an already very high basis in 2019. So we actually have some pretty good support for public uh, for policy um, action on climate change. Um, but what we really need to do now is to build the social mandate for very bold, specific climate change policies um, across different countries and at sub-national level. Um, and we know that a big uh, part of how, uh, to do, how to do this is to actually engage participants, engage citizens in participatory decision making. Um, so, for example, we see the rise of uh, climate change uh, citizens assemblies at national and sub-national levels. This sort of um, participatory engagement is a really great way of actually not just building the social mandate and um, but also uh, enabling policymakers to take those bold actions because it gives it gives them a sense that they actually um, have that support to take uh, to take those measures. Um, so in conclusion, um, radical social and behavioral change is required to reach net zero in the same way that we've had to take radical uh, steps to change our lifestyle to cope with um, COVID-19. But we can also learn a lot from how we've responded to COVID-19 in terms of how we mobilize climate change action. They're not, uh, they have very uh, important differences in terms of the issue characteristics, but actually we know we've seen that radical lifestyle change is possible um, from how we've coped with the pandemic. But because of these issue differences, we need to ensure that we actually um, engage with people to build a social mandate for bold policies to tackle climate change, that we implement multiple interventions that build people's self-efficacy and motivation, that change social norms and remove structural barriers to lifestyle change uh, for climate change, and crucially that we get the timing right so that we target our interventions to when habits are disrupted. And I think this year, the, the coming few months will be a really critical period for intervening while habits are still malleable and before we get locked into uh, new, less sustainable ways of life, potentially as lockdown restrictions are uh, removed. And I'll leave it there, thanks. All right, thank you, Lorraine. So we're gonna move into the question and answer portion. It looks like we have about 12 minutes. So go ahead and keep putting questions into the chat. I'll do my best to work through all of them. Uh, so I'm gonna start with one for Doreen uh, once we get the other speaker spotlighted, but the question is from Janet Swim and she's asking, does your work connect with work on perspective taking? For example, uh, is immersion like empathetic perspective taking and distance like object, object perspective taking? Yeah, thank you for that question. I do, I do think that um, this work does connect with perspective taking or different types of perspective taking in that way. Unfortunately, I did not include um, measures of empathy in in these studies, but we do have um, one or two, two like dependent variables that kind of get at this. So, for example, we ask participants how to rate how unjustly they thought Flint, Flint residents were treated. And in one study, we do find that people who were in the immersion condition, they were more likely to say, yes, um, Flint residents were treated unjustly. Um, and then we also have a question about how, how familiar do you think, how familiar do, I was like the one um, advantage of giving a talk at home. I'm like, I can look at the data. But um, yeah, one question around how familiar do Flint residents seem to be? And people in the immersion condition um, did say that they felt more, they felt that Flint residents were more familiar. So I do think that somewhat gets at, at the empathy and perspective taking um, that people are really putting themselves in the Flint, Michigan residents' shoes, but we don't have a measure of empathy. Um, so if we do another study, I'll definitely be sure to include some of those items. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Kirsten um, and it's from Nick Morales. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, the question is involving the core Twitter activist, is there some particular theme of tweets that they are sharing? Like, are there more visuals or references to other information or some other type of theme? Yeah, that's a great question. 
I guess, no, the answer is no. I think these are people who are tweeting a whole lot, like a whole remarkable lot. And a lot of that work is sort of lifting up, surfacing and reconnecting things that other people have created. Um, one of my students has been looking to see whether um, out of this mess, we can see particular frames about climate sort of crowdsourced into prominence. And that work is not done, but I think it's looking like, yes, that is the case. Um, we have another paper from a few years back where we looked at the ways in which hashtags are used as sort of framing mechanisms, sort of ways to signal that you're orienting to the issue in a particular way. And we do certainly see that within this sort of core group, there's a core set of umbrella hashtags that are used to organize the whole conversation and then sort of event specific framing kinds of hashtags that I, you can think of them as like sort of signaling mechanisms that help say this is the kind of, of take I have on this issue. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I would say at least for the regular individuals who are serial participants, um, they're, they have a pretty diverse approach to choosing to amplify different pieces of content. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to hop back to Durain. Uh, this is from Mark Ferguson, and his uh, question is, he's not quite clear on the copium manipulation framing. You mentioned this first third person frame, but he's wondering whether individual group frame might also be involved here. For instance, it might be that the distance uh, framing primes personal or individual identity, which you would expect to encourage less collective action. Um, so he's wondering if you considered or maybe even empirically teased apart the different interpretations of the coping manipulation. Yeah, that is also a great question. I um, So just in terms of the coping frame, the although the immersion, the immersion um, conditions were definitely more perspective taking instructions, the um, Re the distance reappraisal and objective focus instructions we pulled from kind of classic um, reappraisal literature. But I think you're, yeah, you're definitely onto a good point just around, and as my talk demonstrates, these coping strategies also have implications beyond sort of um, emotions, right? So there is some work um, showing that people who engage in distance reappraisal, that they report um, decreased salience of their social identities. And so I think that's definitely somewhat answering your question. And um, we did collect some additional data just around if people felt kind of more connected to Flint, Michigan residents after engaging in one of these, um, in reflecting on the events from one of the three perspectives. And we do show that people who were in the distance condition, they kind of reported less, feeling less similar and feeling less connected to Flint residents. So I, I do think that that does get at your point and it would be important to to tease apart all right how emotion if, how emotions are playing a role how um different aspects of identity might be playing a role as well so thank you for raising that all right so this question is for lorraine and it's from kim and she says uh do we need interventions to help people maintain their new habits we can try and lock in some infrastructure support to support them. But if we go back to normal, is there a fear that the cues for those habits are going to also be disrupted? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And I think actually uh, there was another question that was very similar uh, to that one as well. Um, I think that's absolutely right. So I think that the context uh, has to be pretty stable in order to kind of lock in new habits. That's one of the kind of key um, preconditions for a habit to emerge is that, it, the, stable, that the context has to be quite stable. So if, for example, we have um, city centers, which have, um, they've got this kind of in some, some cities like pop up sort of cycle lanes to encourage people to cycle and, and walk more and to drive less during uh, the, the pandemic. If those are removed, um, then yeah, there's a very strong chance that even if people have been cycling more uh, during lockdown, that they will revert back to their car use habits once those infrastructure changes um, uh, go back to how they were. So we absolutely have to lock in 
what this is this was my point really about we have to kind of lock in these emerging habits that we've kind of been sort of uh, adopting during lockdown um, and so we need to have employers on board to encourage people to maybe work from home at least some some of the week uh, beyond you know once restrictions are removed and I think there are encouraging signs that many employers are starting to uh, consider that um, and similarly kind of city um, officials need to be kind of really thinking about this is a great opportunity now to actually retain some of this uh, active transport infrastructure that we've started to to put in place to actually keep uh, people um, cycling and walking and so on. So yeah, we definitely need to have all of those things in place for the longer term to keep these habits. Great, thank you. Okay, this one is for Kirsten from Jeremy Becker. And he says, uh, did you happen to analyze the time between when the major event occurred and when the people tweeted about them? So wondering if there's some causal moment where users might be waiting for the movement users to tweet about the issues first maybe to provide visibility or even to enhance issue legitimacy yeah that's a great question too and i yes but it was led by my my phd student who's yinging chen who's now at university of south carolina and so i will try to describe a little bit of what she found um so she was really interested in the shape of the bursts of attention so if you zoom in on those tiny little spikes you see like kind of a zoo animal species of all the different shapes public attention to a climate sort of issue sub event can take. Um, and she looked not only at whether different the, did the sort of critical core influence the shape of attention going forward, but then she also paired that with like news media attention data by minute, uh, as well as search data, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, there is no clear causal direction looked at sort of longitudinally. They look really different. There's some little inkling that events where the, what you might call the sort of, I don't know, start off crystal was led by an activist movement. The, the, the public attention bursts do tend to start with activist organizations, NGOs and well-known activists at the very beginning. So like the people's climate, you know, those who strategically see it coming, but that doesn't hold even for, you know, like COP21 or these big events that were very much like, you know, governmental organizations plus activists at the same time, you don't even see those same kinds of patterns. And so, you know, something we've really been wrestling with theoretically is, when you see such difference across these little arcs, when you zoom into them, what is this an example of? And in particular, you know, I think our work isn't really focused on where do you intervene, but to generate sort of, you know, broader theoretical structures that can help us think about strategy, where we can reach people with these persuasive messages at certain times. And we're not, we're definitely not there yet. So good question. Okay, and I have one more for you, Kirsten. Uh, this is from Disha Ba. Sorry if I really just slaughtered the pronunciation of that, but uh, they're asking, is there any other social media besides Twitter that shows these similar kinds of flashes of attention and are serial participants related to the attention aspect of the climate change issue uh, that you've studied or that you know of? Yeah, that's also a really good question. And and it probably requires a longer conversation that I could nerd out on for a very long time. But I think it's really important that actually the structure of these bursts of public attention is very sensitive to the structures of the platforms where they emerge. So as you, you know, those of you who are Twitter users know, Twitter facilitates what I might call strange interaction organized through things like hashtags. Uh, platforms like Facebook are much better at known other types of interactions, which can facilitate sort of chains between known people. So passing things along, but Facebook is not as good necessarily for discovery, at least not yet. And so, you know, I think a, 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 some work that needs to be done is to try to organize what are the sort of affordances or features or structures of these different platforms that then help us to predict what form attention will take to a particular issue, how long it will be sustained. I think going back to that idea of sort of zoo animal species, like the shape of what that attention is going to look like. I think we're starting to do that in sort of political, political communication, that is sort of campaign communication, we're starting to have a better understanding. But for the climate issue, I think there's a lot of work there that needs to be done and really is at the intersection of, you know, what kinds of communications do these structures facilitate or even encourage, and then the different ways in which individual people are motivated to use them. And sort of where those two meet is going to be a really important point, I think, to understand how we can insert sort of persuasive interventions into those spaces. All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed a nice break for your eyes and some movement away from your computer these last few minutes. 
So we are on to our next session. And just uh, to review our kind of etiquette for the session, um, all questions will be saved until after the last speaker. But with that said, we do encourage everybody to type your questions into the chat as we're going along. Um, we're kind of keeping track of those um, and it, it makes it easier for the organizers if you can type those as we go along. So please feel free. Um, after the Q&A, we're gonna have optional breakout rooms again with each of the speakers. So you can go into a room with the speaker of your choosing if you'd like for a few minutes. And then another thing that I wanna highlight about this session is we have a faculty presenter and then we have four student presenters. And as is tradition, we're gonna be voting on the best student talks and posters. So do pay attention to the student talks um, as well as Dylan's talk, <laughs> but uh, we will be voting on uh, who, who you think should get the award for best student talk for this session. Um, and Kim will post the link for voting at the uh, end of the session. So with that said, um, this next panel is loosely themed around topics of climate and society. And I'm Nicole Sintov, if I didn't mention that, and I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dylan Bugden. He is a Boeing Distinguished Assistant Professor of Environmental Sociology at Washington State University. And Dylan, you can go ahead and share your slides. And he will be kicking it off for us. And these blitz sessions are about five slides in five minutes. So uh, we hope that you will take the opportunity to ask questions and chat with Dylan in the breakout rooms after this brief talk. So take it away. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to go very quickly through these first couple slides. Today I'm going to talk about what Americans believe about environmental inequality and why, and if I have a little bit of time, try to reflect on what this might tell us about the persistence of environmental inequality in the United States despite now nearly 40 years of an environmental justice movement and efforts to try to curtail it. So a little bit of background. Um, oddly enough, Despite uh, environmental sociology and environmental social science spending many decades now doing public opinion research on various environmental problems, we know practically nothing about what Americans believe um, about environmental inequality. And despite the additional insight that public opinion does play a role in shaping social change, um, we don't really know how it affects the processes of the, both the formation of environmental inequality and its persistence um, in the US. Coincidentally, there is a growing body of literature, um, really from the last 10 or so years, a lot of which is probably presented at this conference, um, on the relationship between public opinion on economic inequality and various um, processes of social change. One of the things we've learned is that what the public believes about economic inequality does seem to affect uh, policies to address economic inequality, um, and that what the public believes about economic inequality is shaped by things like economic mobility, beliefs about meritocracy in society and uh, various types of racial attitudes. What I want to do with this study is to try to leverage this research on economic inequality to try to derive some insights about what Americans believe about environmental inequality, why, and then again, if possible, maybe develop some hypotheses for how public opinion shapes the persistence of environmental inequality in the United States through various mechanisms. Just a bit of background on the data. We're going to look at a, a sample of US residents with an N of 1,000. This is from the NORC Amerispeak Omnibus Survey, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, and the data was collected in the summer of 2021. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of data in the paper that I sent in the chat, but we're going to focus on two things here. We're going to focus on one outcome, uh, which are beliefs about whether environmental inequality exists. And there's six items here along two axes. The first axis access is the type of environmental uh, good or bad. So we'll look at access to green space, um, exposure to environmental pollution, and then harm that is caused by the persistence of these types of inequalities. And then another axis is the actual type of social group. So we'll look at uh, comparisons between white communities and communities of color and poor communities and wealthy communities. So really there's six items and six different types of beliefs about environmental inequality. I'll show you some descriptive data on that. And then we'll look at the relationship between those outcomes and the sort of the standard measures of racial resentment. The thing to understand about racial resentment in the time that we have is that it's, 
it's really kind of a proxy for the measure of something we might call colorblind racial ideology as established by people like Eduardo Bonilla Silva and others. All right, so there's a couple things that might stand out about this, this figure here. This is what American, this is whether Americans believe in different types of environmental inequality. Two things stand out. One is that unlike economic inequality, there's still quite a lot of denial and lack of knowledge about this particular form of inequality in US in American society. But more importantly, I think, is that there's a stark difference between whether people accept and believe that such inequality exists along the axes of income versus, um, versus race. In fact, people are almost twice as likely to believe that environmental inequality exists between poor and wealthier communities versus white and non-white communities. Even though the research literature on environmental equality very clearly shows that this is not necessarily the case, that the most prominent axis of environmental equality is race, that if we know the racial uh, composition of a community, we're much more capable of predicting uh, exposure to environmental pollution than we are if we understand uh, levels of wealth in that community. Additionally, we can look at this measure of racial resentment. Um, these are all six items. And what you're seeing here is that as levels of racial resentment increase, as endorsement of colorblind racial ideology increases, the likelihood that a person believes, for instance, that a community of color is more likely to experience environmental pollution drops precipitously um, from an estimate of around 70% likely to answer the question correctly at the lowest levels of endorsement of colorblind racial, racial ideology down to about 10% at the highest levels. Um, what these two uh, data points really show us is that Americans tend to understand environmental inequality through a lens of colorblind racial ideology. We, in the minds of many Americans, we live in a post-racial society, and therefore environmental inequality simply can't exist along axes of race. That it might exist, but if it does, it's going to exist on an axis of income or of wealth rather than race. And what this might tell us a little bit is that part of why environmental inequality persists is because we refuse to acknowledge the fact that it is in fact a racialized problem. Um, I think I timed that just right. Uh, you can find the paper on uh, the link that I sent in the chat or in the slide. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff here on issues around fairness and policy support. And then I'm very excited to say that I'll have new paper on this preprint or new data in this preprint in a few months where I reproduce the same questions with a sample of local policymakers, which I think will really add to this broader argument around colorblind environmental racism. All right, and with that, I'm done. Thank you, Dylan. That was wonderful. Next up, we are going to move into our student presenters. Um, so again, if uh, some of you are late in joining us, we will be voting on the best student talk from this session after the session. And our first student presenter is Jordana Composto, who is a PhD candidate at Princeton University. Yes, hello. Thank you. Uh, today, I will be talking about the diffusion of climate norms in the banking sector. There's a large body of work that examines social norms as a powerful mechanism for change, especially in the context of climate. In the work I'm presenting today, we focus on norms as they are stated by organizations. In this context, norms serve two purposes. They signal top-down directives from leaders to the broader organization, and they signal to other organizations, uh, specifically competitors. The financial sector holds a uniquely influential and broad role in facilitating the decarbonization of the economy. Banks offer loans and financing which shape infrastructure, energy systems, and entire business sectors. The banking sector is also highly competitive. So we seek to understand organizational change through our driving research question, how do norms about climate diffuse through the banking sector? To address this question, we collect a corpus of publicly available text data, including reports, press releases, and websites from the six largest banks in the US. The primary topic of all of the documents is climate, sustainability, or the environment. Then we break these documents into sentences and use a rule-based algorithm to identify if the sentence is normative. We validated this method by comparing the algorithm's accuracy to the accuracy of human coders. The result is a corpus of norms with attributes for the date and bank. An example norm in this corpus is from Bank of America. It reads, as one of the world's largest financial institutions, Bank of America has a responsibility and an important role to play in helping to mitigate and build resilience to climate change. Our primary analysis is of the temporal vectorized cosine similarity between banks. Pretty much we look at how norms diffuse in a network over time. 
So to illustrate this, I'm going to start by zooming in on our Bank of America example. This norm mentions responsibility and being a leader in the financial sector. Um, so that was April 2019. A few days later, Morgan Stanley published a document that discusses uh, tipping points in policy. This is not very similar to the Bank of America norm, so you can see there's no connector and low document similarity. Next, JP Morgan makes a statement about joining the TCFD, which is an industry-driven disclosure framework and a type of policy. They also use the language of being an industry leader, therefore combining the Bank of America and Morgan Stanley norms. So Bank of Bank of America and Morgan Stanley are not very similar to each other, but they are similar to JP Morgan, and the temporal element allows us to look at diffusion. So each norm in the corpus is compared to the subsequent two months of norms, and the text similarity is aggregated to the bank level in a norm diffusion network. So let's start by looking at the nodes of the network. Each represent the aggregate of the bank's norms. Their distance from each other represents the overall document similarity between banks. Uh, closer means more similar. Now let's examine the edges. Edges here represent the directional text similarity between each pair of banks, and the arrow indicates the directional flow of text. The thickness and numeric labels uh, refer to the average vectorized coast similarity. At a high level, this norm diffusion network shows a tightly knit network in which five of the banks have multiple connections to other banks in the network. Next, we wanna understand the role that different banks play in this network. We do this by evaluating the ratio of inflowing to outflowing edges of each bank. City and Bank of America have the highest ratios indicating that they state norms before other banks. It's also interesting to see how similar City and Bank of America are to each other and the reciprocal flow of norms between the two of them. So we might call these influencers in the network. On the other end of the spectrum, we find that Wells Fargo has a higher rate of inflow to outflow. Uh, this means that they, they adopt normative language from others more than they originate it. So we might call these our adopters. In conclusion, we can use this paradigm to understand how norms move through the banking sector and catalyze change. We also find that text data is especially relevant in organizational change because it serves as both a reflection of norms and a way of establishing new norms and intentions within the sector. We're working on a paper now that examines how non-bank actor, actors, so for example, shareholders, activists, and industry leaders can interact with this network. So using this paradigm, we can evaluate the success of interventions and actors that target organizational and policy change in the banking sector. Uh, thank you all. I want to especially thank my collaborators. And you can find the uh, data and scripts um, at our OSF page uh, as we work through publication. Thank you, Jordana. So again, if you have questions for Jordana, please put them in the chat and we will address those at the end of the session. Next up, we have Tyler Jacobs, another one of our student presenters. He's a PhD candidate at Miami University of Ohio. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to share my research on natural disasters and climate change perception. At the heart of my research is the question, is seeing believing? Do people living in areas with more natural disasters have more pro-environmental beliefs? Some research suggests the answer is yes. Multiple studies have found that single firsthand experiences with a natural disaster do tend to increase beliefs that climate change is real, at least in the short term. However, we posit that there may be differences for repeated disaster experiences. Research on the emotion of negative all has found that natural disasters trigger existential threat and learned helplessness, which we think may particularly be the case if the experiences are repeated. This could lead people living in disaster prone areas to feel like there is nothing they can do about climate change, and they may even show reactance in regards to their climate beliefs. Thus, we have two competing hypotheses. People living in these areas could have more pro-environmental beliefs, or it could be the opposite. And we also wanted to explore if there are possible curvilinear relationships. Okay, to explore 
these ideas, we started with a data set of severe natural disasters since 1970 in U.S. counties, emerged this with survey data on beliefs, risk perceptions, and communications about climate change also at the county. To account for potential confounds, we started with a control model including race, gender, and rurality within a county, as well as the proportion of voters who voted for Trump in 2016 as a proxy for conservatives. We then used hierarchical regression to subsequently add terms for number of severe disasters within a county, as well as a quadratic term to test for possible parabolic effects. I do want to note that all betas here are significant. However, p-values are not informative in very large data sets. Therefore, we only treated effects as meaningful if their size was small or greater. Contrary to some past research, a greater number of natural disasters in the area did not predict people having greater beliefs that climate change was real. On the positive side, this did predict greater support for government action on the climate, but actually less support for individual citizen action. Perceived climate risk and amount of climate communication both showed quadratic effects. So we graphed these out to visualize the trend. To orient you to these graphs, the y-axis indicate the percent of participants in a county who answered agree or strongly agree to items asking if climate change was going to be harmful and if they communicated with others in their community often about climate change. For both, we found U-shaped effects such that a moderate amount of natural disasters predicted the least perceived risk and the least amount of communication in one's community about climate change. Let's turn back to our original question. Is seeing belief? In support of this proposition, we did find that more natural disasters within a county did predict greater support for government policy. Contrary to this though, chronic exposure did not predict greater beliefs that climate change was anthropogenic and actually predicted less support for individual action. This lends credence to our learned helplessness hypothesis that people in these areas may feel like there is nothing they can do as individuals and that only institutions have the power to act. The U-shaped effects for risk perceptions and communication indicate that in the face of terrifying events, people may prefer to ignore what they are saying until the evidence becomes undeniable. Future research will explore this possible mechanism of learned helplessness and work to develop interventions to make people feel more empowered in the face of a threatened climate. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, up next, we have another one of our student presenters, Emily Law. She is a PhD student at Cornell University. All right, hi everyone. Um, so today I will be talking about um, whose beliefs matter when it comes to climate change. So we all know that collective change needs to happen in a just and inclusive way. And this requires the involvement of marginalized and impacted individuals and communities. So as researchers, we can continue to uplift these perspectives by not only asking how can we motivate concern, but to also ensure how can we um, or how can we ensure that the concerns of marginalized groups matter? People of color are the most affected by the consequences of climate change. In particular, Blacks and Latinos are more likely to live near areas of environmental degradation, such as hazardous industrial sites and pollution emitting power plants. Looking at the green bars, um, these groups also report the highest levels of environmental and climate change concern. Yet to the general public, the red bars, they are perceived to care the least amount in comparison to other groups. This chart is from 2016, but more recent data suggests that this pattern is still evident today. Essentially, this speaks to a larger issue, which is that collective action on environmental issues like climate change 
might be hindered if we falsely perceive that minority groups, some of the fastest growing demographics in US society do not care about the environment. The discrepancy between what people think others believe and what is actually being reported can be further understood by studying normative social expectations, otherwise known as second order beliefs. Um, this type of belief can be very influential, even more so than our own beliefs. In the context of climate policy, one study demonstrated that if participants believe most of the public believe in climate change, they were more likely to support climate action themselves. Furthermore, we know that people of color face additional barriers such as discrimination and structural racism, which juxtaposes their racial identity um, with the norms of white middle-class American society. However, not much is known about how the second order beliefs um, we hold about different groups in the US might differentially predict for individuals support on environmental policies. So the current study sought to do two things. First was to conceptually replicate um, prior findings that suggest second order beliefs predict for policy support, this time using a five item uh, index of policy support. And secondly, we wanted to know if second order beliefs of different groups differentially predict for policy support. So on the one hand, normative influence um, might suggest that second order beliefs about whites concerns might be most predictive of individuals policy support since whites are the majority group and are also highly stereotyped as environmental. On the other hand, identity-based motivation theory might suggest that um, beliefs about one's racial ethnic in-group may matter the most, such that second order beliefs about whites concerns might be most predictive among whites, second order beliefs about blacks might be most predictive among blacks and so on. In order to address these questions, we ran a secondary data analysis of a nationally representative survey my collaborators ran um, this survey through GFK in 2016, and this included an oversample of self-identified uh, Latinos and Hispanics. We decided to focus on the three largest samples, whites, blacks, and Hispanics, and ran a, reg a regression to test the relationship between second order beliefs and policy support. Second order beliefs was measured by asking um, participants, how concerned do you think whites, Hispanics, and blacks are about the environment? And consistent with um, prior research, we find that individual level policy support is positively associated with perceiving that others are concerned about the environment. Now turning to the question of whether this pattern differs um, depending on the race of the respondents. This table depicts Blacks, Hispanics, and Whites on the left with the second order beliefs of the three different groups on the following column right here. And results highlight that second order beliefs about whites, the majority group that is also stereotyped as most concerned, may hold more sway in one's personal support for environmental policies. And it's important to keep in mind that these findings are correlational um, and cannot provide strong evidence of a causal relationship. Yet our observation that second order beliefs about whites were more predictive of individuals policy support than were beliefs about blacks or Hispanics environmental concerns seen even among our black respondents um, is more consistent with a normative influence account rather than an identity-based motivation account. Future research may want to further scrutinize the role of norms, group stereotypes, and racial ethnic self-identity in these patterns, bearing in mind that racial identity is more complicated than our survey measures could reflect and that the groups studied here are not monolithic. Thank you everyone for your time and thank you to my collaborators. Thank you, Emily. Okay, and last up in this session, we have our final student presenter, Corinne Chai, who's a master's student at the University of Cambridge. Can everyone see and hear everything? Great. So today I'm going to be discussing how identity-based messaging can enhance or hinder the formation and maintenance of racially and ethnically diverse climate coalitions. And the time is really ripe for examining this topic, given that we've begun to see recent calls for climate action growing, such as the protests on September 19th, 2019, which were the largest and most diverse in history. And so my talk's going to be a little different than some of the other talks today in that it's non-empirical. And it's driven by the question, how can social psychological research inform the development of climate messaging that engages diverse groups? 
And to answer this, I'm actually going to be um, showing you three common and untested assumptions held by practitioners and scholars that may undermine effective climate communication, um, provide empirical evidence that demonstrates their problematic nature, and then give you a few candidate alternative frames for designing messaging. And the reason why this topic is important is because climate change disproportionately impacts vulnerable groups. Environmental organizations are looking to diversify their membership, but have a history of exclusion. And the political left has really begun to make recent progress in history in forming a diverse coalition unified around a single policy platform. And so if we move to assumption one, it's that narrowing messaging towards specific identity groups will engage targeted individuals. And although this sometimes can happen, it doesn't happen all the time. In fact, some labels such as environmentalists, which seem fairly innocuous, can actually have unintended effects. For example, research by Pearson and colleagues show that um, non-whites and whites associate this word with white, highly educated, and middle-class people. So appeals like this may fail to engage other racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. And one reason why these appeals might backfire comes from identity-based motivation theory, which Emily just briefly touched on. And this theory posits that people follow the normative in-group behaviors um, and that social identification shapes their in-group goals. And so when this theory was tested for health promotion behaviors, they found that priming race ethnicity actually increased health fatalism among minorities who saw unhealthy behaviors as characteristic of their in-group. And so based on these findings, we can say that narrowing messaging towards specific identity groups actually has some potential to backfire. So some candidate alternative frames include employing broader frames like national identity, which can make sense of negative stereotypes of a group come to mind, or acknowledging issues at the intersection of environment and identity. So for example, people think about environmental issues as a function of their race or SES, with non-white and lower income people rating human oriented issues like racism as more environmental. So acknowledging these may be more effective. Assumption two is that conveying inequity enhances agency and support for policies to reduce inequity. However, revealing inequity can actually be counterproductive. For example, showing whites disparities in incarceration rates actually heighten their support for policies that enable such disparities, such as California's three strikes law. And it also can produce maladaptive responses among minorities. For example, showing African-Americans black white cancer rates actually reduce their intentions of getting a future cancer screening. And so with this in mind, we can actually see that conveying inequity can actually diminish agency and support in some cases. And so some candidate alternative frames that we can take from these other fields that have looked at this is providing context on what produces disparities to really prevent stereotyping and victim blaming. And also showing the role of institutions in really furthering inequality, but also in the potential for them to advance policy change. And one real world, real world example of an initiative that's actually working to uh, grapple with this assumption is covering climate now. And they're a global journalism initiative that's actually been creating reporting guides for journalists on how to discuss climate inequality. Finally, assumption three is that pro-diversity messaging is viewed as equitable and inclusive by both majority and minority groups. However, diversity initiatives can actually have a variety of unintended consequences. So for example, majority groups might see these as showing that they're treated unfairly. For example, whites who saw pro-diversity messaging versus neutral recruiting messaging actually perceived a higher likelihood of discrimination against whites. And among minorities, it can signal that their inclusion is really due to their race rather than their hard work or ability. And so environmental organizations really looking to diversify their membership may benefit from some candidate alternative frames, including empowering employees to see themselves as allies rather than targets of bias training. And when discussing diversity with minority groups, highlighting their merit and competence to avoid making them feel tokenized. And so the main takeaway is that I really hope that you get from this is that these common and untested assumptions that may undermine effective communication, identity-based messaging can really improve the engagement of minority groups, and that ultimately social psychological research can inform the development of climate messaging. Especially thanks to my collaborator, Adam Pearson, the Body, Mind and Behavior Lab, the Social Cognition and Interaction Lab, the Organizing Committee, and you all. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause to all of our Blitz speakers. Everyone was on time, so we're actually one minute ahead of schedule, which is awesome. Great job. OK, um, I am going to jump into some Q&A. So uh, if you all have questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat, and we'll do our best to, to get to all of them. So our first question is from Tom Dietz, and this is for Dylan. Tom is asking, 
how does the measure you use relate to symbolic racism, to the symbolic racism scale used a lot in political science? Sure. So it's similar, in, in a, at least in the regard that like a lot of modern measures of racial attitudes, that it's trying to measure implicit racial attitudes, right? We used to a long time ago try to measure explicit racial attitudes. Americans started to learn that they're not supposed to say those things. Become in, it becomes a little more internalized and people start to they're not going to tell you that they dislike and actively want to discriminate against a person of color, but they will, uh, you can elicit responses around whether they believe society is now post-racial, for instance, which is the key to the racial resentment scale that I talked about, uh, as well as post as the club on racial ideology. Um, and then I think they just, they vary a little bit maybe in what they're exactly measuring, but the idea is that they're underlying, they're capturing underlying implicit racial attitudes. Um, and I think if I remember the symbolic racism scale correctly, and I probably don't, I do think it's still getting at this idea of, of, of a post-racial society as being sort of the underlying belief that shapes the racial attitudes that people hold. But I could, I could be misremembering. And I do think I, I talk about it in the preprint. I think that there's like a paragraph in there where I talk about the, the interrelationship between all these different measures. Um, but that's probably the best answer I, I can give. Okay, um, before I jump to the next question, I just wanna highlight, um, that we do have uh, voting open for the student presenters and Kim just pasted the link for voting into the chat. So please do vote on the best student presenter. Okay, um, our next question is from Marjorie Prokosh and this is for Tyler. And this ties into Dylan's talk as well. So Tyler, uh, Marjorie wants to know, did you examine the impacts of how SES and race may play into your findings? So for instance, are people in poorer or more historically segregated disaster prone areas more prone to the learned helplessness response? Well, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So it hasn't some, it, this isn't something that I've tested yet, but I think it certainly would be a great idea to examine how that um, SES or race may kind of moderate these effects. Uh, yeah, it certainly makes sense to me that perhaps due to some of the things that like Dylan or Corinne talked about where if a lot of climate messages don't always act up or if they're already experiencing a lot of other environmental injustice effects like more toxins in their communities that they might even more, it's possible that people in these groups might even be more likely to feel like there's nothing we can do. So, but, and, but maybe institutions can do something, but yeah, maybe there's nothing as an individual that one could do. Okay. All right. Our next question is for Jordana. And this is from Mark Ferguson. And Mark is asking, do you think that who is an influencer versus an adopter is a general status across issues or more of an issue specific status? So for instance, have you looked at factors that could help predict such status like stock price, scandal, salience, et cetera? Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting question. And that's uh, kind of slated really high for our next steps. Um, the group of six banks that we chose, we chose because they are very similar along these uh, status factors. They're the six largest banks in the US, um, which makes them highly competitive, which makes this uh, influencer adopter relationship really important uh, and particularly, I think, easy to see. Um, the, I think the way that we are investigating this is on the non-bank actor side. So one of the uh, other analyses we're doing is looking at how uh, coalitions and mission statements of those coalitions um, influence this network. So on the, on the coalition side, we can look at if a coalition is kind of bank initiated or initiated by an activist group or something. For example, the TCFD um, organization is started by Mike Bloomberg, very much an industry insider. So the language uh, and norms that come from the TCFD group uh, are you know, highly, highly influenced by those leaders in the industry. Uh, a group like um, maybe Bay, uh, Rainforest Action Network is more of an activist group, so the language is different. So we're looking at uh, those type of actors, but uh, not, not for banks uh, for this paper, but that's a really interesting question. 
Okay, follow up for, for Jordana. This one's from Asaf Mazar. Um, he says, very interesting work. Do you have a sense of how these changes in social norms correlate with banks funding of fossil fuels or other concrete sustainable actions? Uh, yes, yeah, so part of this is uh, looking at, part of the paper is also looking at investment and divestment uh, statements. So we uh, have a separate data set that is um, uh, kind of connected and we, we do see uh, just a general increase in divestment statements. Um, it is hard to connect the two data sets, um, which is why I didn't show it today, uh, but we do see just an overall increase. I think what is interesting is the like interconnected nature of the network, um, the city and Bank of America being so close together and also the influencers is really interesting because it means that you know maybe they wouldn't go forward alone, but having a second major player kind of out ahead um, makes them more likely to take action. But yeah, that's something we're looking at. Okay, our next question is for Emily and this is from Disha Bala. Emily, have you looked at any potential solutions or interventions to mitigate the effects of second order beliefs on the mentioned racial and ethnic groups? Do you know of second order beliefs or other groups that also affect support for environmental policy? It's funny because I have similar question too that I'm hoping to explore um, in a future study. I think, I mean, it's easier said than done, but to like try to change the norms around how people view like um, certain like racial ethnic groups in the US um, in terms of like environmentalism, maybe something similar to like what Kareen studied. Um, and for second order beliefs of other groups, I'm not too sure um, from the literature I read, they mainly just looked at like the US population as a whole compared to like China as a whole. So looking at the public, but not at like specific subgroups, at least not that I know of. Okay. And actually here's a question for Corinne. Do you think that creating messaging that highlights the disparate impacts of climate change or appeals specifically to racial or ethnic minorities might reinforce social divisions or reduce solidarity? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that um, targeting messaging does have the potential to be less likely to engage broad groups or could even further a stereotype that you know some groups are less concerned. So when you're creating climate messaging, it's really important to balance making it broad enough to show climate change as a collective problem and engage a larger audience while also making sure that you're bringing in these groups that have historically been excluded. And I think that some of the potential frames of employing broader frames like national identity can address some of these concerns. Um, and also I think we could look at some research um, showing that you can actually unite groups under a common identity while still allowing them to maintain their subgroup identities. Um, and that works by Davidio and Gartner. And if you're interested in hearing more about dual identities, be happy to chat about that in the breakout room. Great, and I'm gonna bounce back to Dylan. Um, can you talk about any potential extensions of the idea of colorblind environmental racism? such as how could it be used to understand environmental inequality? I was actually just typing a question for Corinne. Um, I kind of along the, the same lines, what, I'm, what I find really interesting about the environmental justice movement is that it's not very effective. Um, it's good at getting people mobilized in some locations. It's, it wins some local battles, but there's, a, there's some longitudinal research now that actually shows that environmental inequality is getting worse. Um, and I think it's a, it's a, been a bit of a failure within the environmental justice and environmental inequality literature to try to understand why it's not getting better. Um, and I think the idea of colorblind environmental racism, much like the idea of colorblind racial ideology more broadly, has, it's really been applied to understand the kinds of barriers that organizations and social movements bump into as they try to create social change, right? That, you know, Americans don't want to acknowledge that we live in a racialized society. They don't acknowledge inequality is racialized. Well, one of the ways you might need to deal with that is by trying to make it racialized. And my question actually for Crin was sort of like, well, okay, well that, now you're sort of suggesting that's going to be really hard. Um, that part of what the environmental justice movement might run into as a problem is the more you tell Americans that this is a racialized problem, 
the less likely white Americans are to do to like accept it, right? That there's there's this challenge of trying to, as Corinne said, like maintain a broad social identity while preserving the sort of integrity of, of other social the identity of smaller social groups, um, and use that within the like the frame of the environmental justice movement and the environmental movement more broadly. So that's where I I want to take it is to just try to build it out and see how it can be used to think about addressing environmental inequality and the ways that it might signal some barriers that the movement will face, um, particularly in informing policy, which we now have a, a major environmental justice bill on the floor of Congress for, I think, like the second time ever. Um, the first one failed. Um, this one probably will too. And, um, you know, is this part of the problem? Is that we can't get people to identify, to re recognize that the problem is, is fundamentally a racial one. So Corinne, in light of what Dylan just said, do you want to add anything based on your findings? Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with what Dylan had said um, and think that he brought up a really good point that, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about here may actually backfire among pre predominantly white audiences. And so, for example, you know, we saw showing disparities or talking about diversity initiatives. Um, and so I think that it is really hard to make messaging that actually can kind of keep these groups engaged while also bringing in people who, who traditionally have not been a part of this movement and um yeah i think part of this is you know i think that an obvious test would be something like the green new deal which is trying to do that very explicitly right it's trying to keep it's trying to have a broad message by talking about industrial policy right like let's create material benefits for everyone and within that address problems for specific social groups including particular racial groups um environmental justice is a major part of of the green new deal but it's not but it's part of a much bigger and broader story and set of policy initiatives, uh, but something worth trying to actually empirically examine. Thank you. So thank you again to our wonderful first round what speakers. All right, it is 3 p.m. Eastern, so we'll go ahead and get started with the second invited panel session. Um, a couple of announcements before I introduce the first speaker. Uh, look in the chat because Kim has reposted the uh, link to vote for the best student poster. So make sure you vote for your favorite poster that you saw. Um, and just as with the last sessions, we'll save all questions for the end, but please feel free to type them in the chat as they come up throughout the talks and we'll save them to ask to the speakers at the end. And then afterwards, we'll have a breakout room for each speaker where you can go individually ask your questions. Uh, so first up, we have Matthew Ballou, who is an assistant professor of psych at Chapman University. Uh, and Matthew, we are ready for your talk. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Or is it Jen? <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. That mm -hmm. was wrong both times. Thank you, Jenny. All right. So you should see my screen. All right, so hi everyone, as Jenny was saying, um, my name is Matthew Ballou and I'm an assistant professor at Chapman University and a former postdoc at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. So we all know that political polarization has increased sharply over the last few decades. So I will be talking about key contributors and processes that support and amplify a political culture of climate change denialism in the US, making parallels to the COVID-19 crisis. So how are they similar? Well, the pandemic has showed us how quickly a scientific issue can become politicized and polarizing. Data from Pew show that Democrats are twice as likely as Republicans to view COVID-19 as a major threat to public health, jumping from a 26 percentage point difference in March to a 41 percentage point difference in November 2020. Both are also social dilemmas, pitting short-term interests against long-term group interests that require collective action at a global scale. So some people don't wanna to be told what to do. They wanna assert their freedom. Personal gain is more salient to them rather than promoting public health, right? Face masks are muzzles. They constrain their freedom. Both crises are also threatening and eliciting fear and uncertainty and people are getting tired, overwhelmed, apathetic, disenchanted, which can lead to checking out and then there are elites and authorities ignoring the problem, which makes them less urgent and more abstract. And these elites and authorities also play a key role in polarization, 
amplifying their messages through the media. For instance, in just four months, political polarization on the Green New Deal increased drastically. You can see it was driven mostly by conservative Republicans moving from majority support to just about a third supporting the Green New Deal four months later. There was also evidence for a Fox News effect. Republican support decreased the most among frequent Fox News viewers. 54% of frequent viewers supported the Green New Deal in December, compared to 22% four months later. So several studies in addition to this also show that partisan media and elite cues play a key role in exacerbating the political divide. Authorities and leaders can also play a positive role. So regarding the pandemic, immediately after, the, after government leadership, the CDC, right, recommended mask wearing in April 2020, reports of mask wearing in the public greatly increased, and we didn't find this increase across any other preventive measures. We also just had a paper come out on the Greta Thunberg effect. And as we know, who's a monumental leader in climate activism, we found that familiarity with Greta Thunberg predicted collective efficacy beliefs and in turn intentions to take collective action on climate change. And we found this for both liberals and conservatives, even though it was stronger for liberals, just marginally. So leaders and authority figures the media and elites, they all matter, right? They can support positive change, but they can also contribute to political polarization, especially some social media like Facebook, which has been found to be a major contributor to extreme groups and polarized communities through the, dis through the distribution of misinformation and disinformation. And it's not just misinformation and disinformation, but also being exposed to contrary views that perpetuates the divide. Regarding the pandemic, messages from elites through social media, particularly Trump, drove COVID-19 misinformation and polarization on the issue. And it's not just Facebook, but Twitter too, which has been found to be a major source of disinformation on climate change because of bots. So social media is like a megaphone, right? Where misinformation and disinformation gets amplified and tuned via algorithms to susceptible audiences and then these effects are further strengthened by elites, leaders, authorities supporting that misleading information. So let's focus on climate change. Um, let's talk about who demographically may be especially susceptible to these effects and fall into the spiral of climate change denialism. So this is why PCCC Six Americas breakdown from last spring. Just under one in five, America, uh, five Americans are doubtful or dismissive of climate change. And I actually just saw their beliefs and attitude, attitudes report came out today, um, but it doesn't look like the US public opinion on climate change has shifted very much since last spring. So we also did research on the conservative white male effect. And we found consistently that conservative white males were especially likely to hold dismissive views about climate change such as worrying about it less, lowered risk perceptions, reduced policy support. And we also found that higher education was associated with a stronger conservative white male effect. So as education increased, so did the divide between conservative white males and conservatives in general and all other adults in the US. Conservatives, especially conservative white males, became more dismissive with higher education but we found the opposite effect for all other adults. Pulling all of YPCCC's data over the last decade, I also looked at the breakdown of the six Americas and found that the dismissive and doubtful are much more likely to consist of conservative white males and college educated conservative white males, about three times more than the US public. And it's not just climate change. So last spring when YPCCC asked about whether COVID-19 would be a very important issue to people's vote in the 2020 presidential election, 57% of the US population said it would be very important compared to about one in three college educated conservative white males, one in three doubtful, one in three dism dismissive adults. So there are obvious parallels here. Also, in our 2020 research on the conservative white male effect, 
specifically the conservative white educated male effect, we also found that individualism, which consists of cultural values of liberty, freedom, and independence from the government, consistently explained how higher education was associated with the greater political divide on climate change. Conservative white males were more likely to endorse an individualistic worldview and in turn dismiss climate change. And we didn't find this indirect effect among conservative white males with less education, just those with higher education. So to wrap this up, it seems like then that historically advantaged or privileged groups in the US with strong right-wing political ideologies, such as conservative white educated males, are likely key demographic groups involved in the culture of climate change denialism. They may be more susceptible to getting involved in the values, traditions, and practices, practices of denialists, which is further supported by problematic media, especially social media, elites, and authority figures. So what are these cultural values, traditions, and practices? Dismissing the threat, downplaying it, minimizing it, trivializing the issue. It's nothing to worry about. It's not a threat. We're fine. It's not going to harm us, right? Distrust science, distrust scientists, derogate out groups, they're alarmists, reactants, asserting freedom, individualism and autonomy, don't tell me what to do. And perhaps the most insidious practice of them all is the distribution of misinformation and disinformation, because this supports and amplifies the values of the culture and can build a stronger community of quote unquote soldiers to fight for their cause. And then you have giants out there increasing this momentum and facilitating these processes. And it's not just misleading information that's being communicated, but problematic social norms, right? It's okay to do this. It's approved of, my community wants me to, which can then broaden the reach of bringing more people in. So there are many processes at work here. Um, and they likely explain how and why the privileged right get involved in this denialist culture, which further adds fuel to the fire and maintains polarization and rifts in the public and constructs barriers to social change. So this is like a conceptual moderated mediation model and, and this list here is not exhaustive. But being a member of the privileged right may make them susceptible to identification with extreme groups potentially authoritarian leaders they resonate with, motivated reasoning to defend a privileged and right-wing lens, actively seeking out, interpreting, and selectively communicating information that supports their worldview, consumption of right-wing media that aligns with their lens, especially right-wing groups on social media, being a member of the privileged right could also promote a sense of entitlement and cultural worldviews of individualism, freedom from government involvement and libertarianism. Differential vulnerability perspectives suggest that being a member of the privileged right may lower perceptions of vulnerability and risk from threats because of their advantage position in society. Crises also threaten the status quo, right? And the stability of the current system. So there may be a tendency to justify the current system as fair and just and you know, making America great again, right? We don't wanna lose our privilege. And social dominance orientation, including a sense of superiority, supremacy and entitlement and supporting group-based hierarchies to maintain their privilege position. So it's important to understand these key processes and drivers at work because contemporary society is contributing to polarization. The political culture of climate change denialism, as well as other forms of extremism are a really big problem. Spiraling out. Most Americans believe climate change is happening and are worried about it. And the dismissive and doubtful segments are smaller than the alarmed and concerned. But contemporary society is offering a megaphone to amplify their message. And members of the privileged right may be a key demographic group involved in this process. Obviously not every member of the privileged right will fall into it, but there may be a susceptibility at work here because of their ideological tendencies and position in society. society. 
I also wonder about this sometimes in cult psychology and how it might fit in here. So some recent articles draw attention to this, such as the cult of Trumpism or how QAnon rose to fame, recruiting quote unquote digital soldiers, even yoga moms. So I keep referring to these groups as being susceptible to denialism because I think it's important to think about it this way sometimes. Right? Are some people victims of disinformation and extreme problematic leadership? Especially right now, people are psychologically vulnerable because of the pandemic. And according to uncertainty identity theory, uncertainty about the self is a key driver of identification with extreme groups and support for authoritarian leaders. I mean, this is how cults work. They target uncertain people who feel alienated from society, promising an alternate reality. There's an authoritarian narcissistic leader. They get programmed such as through misinformation and disinformation on social media. And then they get exploited. They have to put the group before themselves and fight for the cause. Anywho, that's just food for thought. Um, but ultimately, I think we need more applied work on solution-based approaches to combating this culture of denialism without, for instance, making the left more left and the right more right. So we all know the importance of targeting and tailoring messages to align with the values and motives of audiences. And so I think it's important for us to pay attention to culture and really leverage cultural values to promote change. So rather than just focusing on the changing the individual, we should redirect focus on making climate change solutions part of our culture and values in the US, supported by institutions, leaders, authorities, and corporations. Obviously this is a process because social and cultural change just doesn't happen overnight with one communication size. I, I think we're at a point now where we know a lot and we need to start systematically applying these insights to get this process moving faster. Simple messages put in many different ways on many different mediums repeated often. Some promising messages we should be drilling into the public with personal experiences with climate change or environmental impacts and stories that are affecting people deeply, especially stories from trusted sources such as in-group members and leaders. Talking about the concerns you have, tell people to talk about it, break the silence, tell people to watch out for misleading information, to inoculate them ahead of time. We can also use scientific consensus, right, as a simple message, but we also need to pair it with social consensus to promote social norms. Most Americans think climate change is happening. Most are worried about it. Most support several climate policies. There's bipartisan support for several climate policies. And how about you? Are you with America, right? And solutions, solutions, solutions. We got to hold those accountable, channel the anger and rage and focus on what we need to do and less about the politics of opinions and values. So thank you all. I just want to send some acknowledgments to the YPCCC, YPCCC team, um, as well as Mason 4C. And then I have some other collaborators and co-authors here that I'd like to thank you. So stay well and stay connected and keep healthy, everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks, Matthew. That was great. Uh, so our next speaker will be Emily Diamond, who's an assistant professor of environmental communication at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, Emily, you can, yeah, get your slides up and go ahead whenever you're ready. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, uh, Jenny and, um, and Kim and everyone for inviting me here today to talk to you. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, my research, which looks at how identities interact with strategic communication to inform people's environmental attitudes, specifically on climate change. So the motivation for this work um, is once again, just like Matthew, uh, the high levels of political polarization that we're experiencing in our country, right? So this graph shows how over the past few decades, the median Democrat has become increasingly liberal while the median Republican has become increasingly conservative. And this leaves less middle ground, less opportunity for collaboration and bipartisan policy support to address some of the most important policy issues that we're facing as a country. 
among those issues uh, is, is climate change. And climate change is, is one of the most polarized issues in, in America today. So this graph shows how over time, um, the level of concern about climate change among Democrats and Republicans has drastically increased. And this has led to, this, this lack of bipartisanship has led to a complete lack of meaningful climate change legislation um, and our inability to agree as a country on how much we should be prioritizing this issue. This polarization also creates a lot of issues for communicators. Uh, so basically, because the issues become so polarized, partisanship has now become the lens through which people interpret information about climate change. And this leads to bias information processing. We know a lot about this from psychology and communication studies. When people uh, are, are um, processing information through the lens of their partisanship, they're less likely to critically evaluate information that comes in, leading to many of the things Matthew was just talking about. Um, and more importantly, they tend to reject information that conflicts with their prior views, ideologies, identities. This makes it really hard for us to reach portions of the audience who are not already supportive of climate change policies um, because any information that we try to send conflicts with <clears throat> the partisan lens that they're viewing the issue through. So, what do we do about this? Well, as communicators, we tend to go to our the first tool in our toolbox, which is framing. So framing is a tool that communicators use to highlight a certain aspect or dimension of an issue in order to change the lens through with which people are evaluating the issue. So you've probably seen climate change framed in a number of different ways, maybe as a job creator, uh, as a as a public health crisis, or even as a threat to uh, our cities or our local infrastructure, right? These are all attempts to get people to view a different dimension of the issue than just the political dimension. But unfortunately, what we've found in research over the past decade or more is that it's particularly difficult to change climate change attitudes using frames. Generally, efforts to frame climate change on different dimensions doesn't succeed in changing attitudes across the partisan divide. And that's because people are continuing, continuing to default to attitudes that are in line with their partisan identities, right? They're still looking at this issue through the lens of their partisanship and they're rejecting those messages that don't conflict with that, that, that conflict with that partisanship. So what can we do about this? Well, in thinking about this issue and learning about, uh, <clears throat> about a little bit more thinking harder about the role that political identities and partisan identities play in, in making frames fail, I wanted to think a little bit harder about identities themselves. So you can think about identities as the way that we think about ourselves and our place in the world. And the reason why they're particularly interesting for this question is because they're among the most powerful drivers of our political attitudes, behaviors, and the evaluations of issues and groups that we have. And political identities aren't just partisan identities, right? So we all have lots of different identities and these identities can become political. So our racial identities, gender identities, religious identities, even role-based identities like our occupation or our status as parents, these can all become political identities if they're actively related to a salient political issue. So let's get a little bit into that term salient. This concept of identity salience is what links identities to framing. So identity salience is the idea that in a given context, one or more of our identities is more prominent in our minds and more likely to drive our attitudes and behaviors. So me talking to you right now, my identity as a researcher or a scholar is highly salient. I'm gonna respond to your questions through that identity lens. But later on, uh, when I go home, you know, my identity as a caretaker or as a community leader might become more salient and change my attitudes and behaviors in that context. So what we need to do is make sure that the frames and the messages that we're sending resonate with the identity 
that is salient within an individual at that point in time. One tool that we have to do that is priming. So priming is when someone intentionally increases the salience of a certain identity in order to change how the individual perceives an issue. You can think about it as someone activating a certain identity. And if we can, you know, thinking back about climate change, if we can prime a nonpartisan identity, get people thinking about the issue through an alternative identity lens, maybe the effectiveness of framing will increase. I'm gonna walk you through how this would work kind of in a theoretical framework um, state of mind. So let's say you have a climate change policy question, right? Do you support a carbon tax? Something like that. Because the issue is so highly polarized, people interpret that question through the lens of their salient partisan identity. And we tend to see policy preferences guided by that policy identity. When you introduce a frame in this context, if it conflicts with the individual's partisan identity, that frame is gonna fail. It's not gonna be accepted. It's not gonna change attitudes. But what if instead you have your climate change policy question that's introduced when an individual's non, an aspect, a nonpartisan aspect of an individual's identity is salient. If we introduce a frame that resonates with that nonpartisan identity, it's more likely to be accepted and that might lead to more bipartisan policy agreement. So I'm gonna show you a, a quick case study of what I'm talking about, um, a, a paper that was published earlier this year that looked specifically at parental identities and US parents and how priming an individual's identity as a parent versus priming their identity as a Democrat or a Republican changes how they interpret framing messages on climate change. So in this study, um, as I mentioned, we were looking at how identity salience changes the effectiveness of framing messages on climate change. And I did this through an online survey experiment that compared uh, the effect of a climate change frame, which was a, a message from UNICEF about the impact of climate change on future, future generations on people's concern, their likelihood to undertake pro climate change political behaviors and their policy attitudes on climate change when either their parental or partisan identity was salient. So I had th four treatment groups. The first one just got the framing message. The second group um, had their parental identity primed before they got the frame. The third group had their partisan identity primed, so either Democrat or Republican. And then the fourth group um, got neither the prime nor the frame, and that was the, the control group, the comparison group. Uh, I do want to mention all everyone in this study was a parent in the United States. So I'm just going to jump into the results real quick. Um, this is the results for the Republican. And what I really want to draw your attention to here is the difference between individuals that had their parental identity primed versus individuals that had their Republican identity primed, right? So Republicans who had their parental identity primed before receiving the frame uh, did have a significantly higher levels of climate change concern and intended political behavior. But those who had their Republican identity primed first, the frame had no effect. Um, and I'll talk a second about that frame only condition as well. I know it's a little, a little um, surprising. <laughs> Uh, and then for Democrats, uh, the, the results were much more all over the place, which was somewhat expected because Democratic attitudes on climate change are already so high, we often reach like a ceiling effect there. But I do want to point out very small effect size here. But uh, when a Democrat's identity as a Democrat was first primed, uh, they did show higher levels of climate change concern. So that suggests that getting Democrats to think about themselves as partisans might actually increase climate change attitudes, where it's the opposite for uh, Republicans. So what did this study show us? It showed us that identity salience does matter for framing, particularly partisan identity salience. We need to pay attention to which identity is, uh, is most salient when we're delivering frames. Uh, we, I did find uh, the interesting results that for Republicans, the frame that I chose also resonated with their identity as a parent. So it might have been that that frame was enough to activate their identity as a parent, and we didn't need the additional prime. So that's something to, to look into more in the future. Um, but overall, 
what this is telling us is that social identity context is really important for communications. We need to take into account how people are identifying themselves when they're receiving the messages that we're sending. So there's several open questions left over from, uh, from this study. First of all, how long do the effects last, right? This is the perennial question for, uh, for experimentalists. Um, we can't make any conclusions about this through this study because it was just at one point in time. Because our identity salience changes so often throughout the day, um, I don't expect that the, the results of this one treatment would last that long. However, this does bring up the question, if we repeatedly make the connection for people between their nonpartisan identity and climate change, can that new, that nonpartisan identity now become the default lens for considering questions about climate change? And that might have a longer term impact on climate change attitudes. Uh, it also would be really interesting to see the effect of identity priming without the framing. Um, and then also getting back to that question of, can the frames themselves activate people's identi identities? How can we de design more identity relevant frames? So that's that study. Um, I'm just gonna briefly tell you a little bit about some of the other studies that I've worked on looking at these same questions of nonpartisan identities and climate change and environmental attitudes. Uh, I've got one paper um, right now, hopefully published soon, um, doing a case study with the National Audubon Society. So uh, this, is, this is a real world example of the theory that I'm talking about right now. Basically the Audubon Society um, took several of their uh, conservative members and began sending them messages about the impact of climate change on birds. So two thirds of the North American bird species are threatened with extinction in the next hundred years because of climate change. And what they did, what we documented is that individuals who received that information through the lens of their identities as birders actually you know, became very concerned about climate change and sometimes um, became climate change activists themselves. I also got a couple of reports out last year and, um, that looked at rural Americans and how we can use rural identities to uh, increase environmental concern and policy support through values such as stewardship um, and, and the moral responsibility to take care of the land. Uh, I'm working on a project with fishermen looking at climate change attitudes uh, re revolving around um, the increased sea level rise and uh, shifting shifting um, fish populations. Uh, and then also looking at an identity, uh, Native American identity groups. So specifically working with a um, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe on Cape Cod, trying to understand how their, uh, their cultural identities and their cultural attachment to fishing and uh, shellfish harvesting is threatened by climate change and other environmental contaminants and how you can use identity-based messaging with these groups to change behaviors and uh, environmental attitudes. So I will leave it there uh, and I appreciate your time. Look forward to your questions. Right, thank you, Emily. Uh, so our last speaker is Leif Van Boven, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and also my advisor. Thank you, Jenny. Um, feels like a weird role reversal to have you moderating presentation. Uh, I guess that's part of the training. So um, thank you, obviously, to uh, those organizing the conference today. It's actually been surprisingly smooth and a really great opportunity to engage in different ways. So this is a highly collaborative project, um, very collective in nature. It's part of a, a, a research um, program, really, that we started last spring um, to look at various issues surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and public attitudes relating to the pandemic and other major issues uh, in various countries around the world. For this particular part of the project, um, I wanna be sure I acknowledge the, these three authors up front, um, Jenny, Kimmon, and David, they all played um, a tremendously important role in helping 
identify some of these relevant constructs that we're going to be talking about and helping to um, craft and pare down uh, the measures. Also, I want to acknowledge um, Alex Flores and Marcus Mayorga, who took the lead in coordinating a bunch of different people in collecting data and translating surveys um, and really overcoming a, a huge um, cat herding hurdle in that regard. So climate change obviously is one of the most pernicious, vexing, wicked problems we face, largely because it is about much more than just things getting warmer. Um, it involves any number of interacting interdependent systems and a changing climate is also, also going to change uh, the physical systems that we live in, our economic systems, our political systems, and our health systems. There are a number of ways in which this might happen, but um, you know, one topic that is obviously kind of at the forefront of many people's minds is the ways in which a changing climate may or may not have contributed to um, a pandemic like COVID-19. Uh, last May, the um, investigative journalism uh, outlet ProPublica uh, had this article, how climate change is contributing to skyrocketing rates of infectious diseases. And they wrote, ignoring the connection between climate change and pandemics would be a dangerous delusion, according to one scientist. So the question that we are really concerned with here is uh, who is it, what types of people are more or less likely to see these connections between a changing climate and uh, the emergence frequency of a, or intensity of pandemics um, such as COVID-19. Now, often when we talk about um, public opinions regarding climate change and, and its impacts and policies regarding uh, climate, we tend to focus on um, identities and cultures as they relate to political orientation, liberals or conservatives in particular, as illustrated um, by Matthew and uh, Emily's uh, really excellent talks. What I want to do today is uh, explore a different type of cultural dimension as it relates to attitudes toward um, climate change and, and its relation to things like the COVID-19 pandemic. And this cultural orientation has to do not with political ideology, but with the ways in which people construe themselves as embedded in social networks, as fundamentally a part of a system of traditions and hierarchies and groups, versus more uh, autonomous um, individuals who exert um, a kind of standalone identity in, in uh, the world in which they navigate. Social cultural psychologists have um, examined these kinds of different cultural orientations for several decades. And in general, we can distinguish quite broadly between these sort of two categories. So on the one hand, we have individuals, uh, interesting choice of word, we have people who um, regard themselves really in more collectivist terms, that their self-construals are fundamentally interdependent, that they see themselves uh, largely as identifying in relation to other people and groups. Um, their self-construal exists in this social system that really places an emphasis on kind of harmony. These individuals also tend to adopt much more holistic reasoning styles. When they reason about cause and effects, they tend to pay more attention to kind of relational elements rather than to salient focal um, elements. They tend to think more multidimensionally and they tend to think in terms of contextual causal structures. Another way to think about uh, uh, self-construals Another dimension of self-control really is what we can refer to as an individualistic self-control. These are uh, people who view themselves as really having kind of autonomous standalone identities that exist independent of the social networks of which they are a part. And we see that those individuals tend to adopt a much more 
um, kind of analytical thinking style that they tend to focus on salient singular causal objects, um, identifying causes much more narrowly compared with holistic individuals. Our idea then is that people who have more collectivist self-construals, who view themselves as more kind of embedded in these social networks, and who have more holistic reasoning styles, will be more likely to uh, see connections between a changing climate and the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me walk you through some of the data that we collected and um, highlight some of the key analyses and findings that, that we are identifying. So this data is um, part of a multinational study. These surveys were implemented at the beginning of August of 2020. We have respondents from nationally representative samples from seven different countries um, that really span a range of what are typically regarded as highly individualistic countries versus countries that are more um, collectivist in their um, prevailing sort of cultural worldviews. And we collected a number of measures from individuals within these countries. The first pair of measures that I want to tell you about in, in, involve these measures of cultural orientation. So respondents indicate the degree to which they agree with these um, kind of two sets of statements. One set of statements taps into um, collectivist self-construals. For example, it is important for me to think of myself as a member of my religious, national, or ethnic group. Learning about the traditions, values, and beliefs of my family is important to me. Another cultural dimension uh, emphasizes individualistic concerns. It's important for me to develop my own personal style. It's better for me to follow my own ideas than to follow those of anyone else. And what we want to look at, first of all, is how these different uh, countries vary in their sort of average um, prevailing self-construal, whether it's more collectivist or individualist. So what we've plotted here um, are the different scores between um, agreement with the average collectivist statements and agreement with the average individualistic statements. We've then organized these bars in terms of the um, order of that difference. So the country on the left, Korea, has relatively more collectivist self-construal than individualistic self-construal. The country on the right, the United Kingdom, um, has much less collectivist self-construal than individualistic self-construal. What we're interested in here is whether these country differences in collectivist self-construal versus individualistic self-construal relate to the perception that climate change is related to pandemics like COVID-19. So we ask people how much they agree with the following statement, that climate change made a pandemic like COVID-19 more likely. What I'm going to show you here are now two histograms side by side. So on the left, we have the histogram that I just showed you, where the countries are in order of their relative collectivism. On the right is a histogram displaying the average agreement with that statement that climate change made uh, pandemics like COVID more likely. And what you can see is that just the order of uh, responses across the two countries aligns almost perfectly, that the countries, the greener countries on the left are more likely to see that there is uh, a causal relationship between uh, climate changing and uh, pandemics like COVID-19 and the countries on the right, the more individualistic countries uh, are more likely to disagree with that statement. Now, you'll notice in these histograms that each individual response is actually represented as a um, dot in that, in, so there's sort of a scatter plot for each histogram. And one of the things this highlights is that there's actually a huge amount of variability on both of these responses not only across countries, but also within countries. And in fact, it's a much more powerful tool in many ways to look at differences between individuals in their self-construals and their beliefs and attitudes than to look at differences between countries, because obviously countries differ in many, many ways 
um, which is almost impossible to capture nearly all of. And we can really remove some of that variance if we look at the um, association between these measures at the individual level within country. And that's what I'm showing you in this next graph. So here on the x-axis, we have individual participants' degree of collectivism based on the average of uh, agreement with those four items that I showed you earlier. That is um, plotted against on the y-axis, their agreement that climate change made a pandemic like COVID more likely. And we're displaying separate lines here for uh, the seven different countries. The overall average effect is captured by the dark line in the middle. And what you can see here is that within country, there is generally an upward slope. That within country, the more individuals endorse these collectivist self controls the more they agree that uh, climate change made the COVID-19 pandemic more likely. The only place where we see a downward slope is in Sweden. And in fact, there is a really curious finding that I think we're still trying to wrap our heads around here that in general, the more collectivist the country is, the stronger the slope within the country of the relation between individual level collectivism and agreement uh, that climate change contributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, of course, there are many variables that might be associated with collectivist self -construal. Um, And so I wanna quickly tell you about some of our efforts to um, account for those other factors in looking at these relationships between collectivism and um, perception of interrelatedness. And in particular, two that seem um, especially important or just the recognition that climate change is a reality. Um, so we asked people to respond to a couple of items about how much they agree that climate change is real and caused by humans. Another issue that seems particularly important is the overall degree of ideology. So we asked people the degree to which they are liberal or conservative on um, social issues, economic issues, and in general. We additionally include a range of um, kind of standard demographic measures. What I plotted in this graph then are standardized regression coefficients from a mixed model that includes all of these predictors. It also includes random slopes for countries. So we're sort of subtracting out those country effects. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that the coefficient that's at the top, collectivism, uh, remains significant controlling for all of these other factors. And it is about the same in magnitude as um, ideology. So the more collectivist people construe them, themselves, the more they agree that climate change made a pandemic more likely. That effect is about the same size as the more conservative individuals identify themselves as being uh, the less they think climate change contributed um, to making the pandemic more likely. Now. One of the kind of key ideas with holistic thinking that is associated with collectivist self construal is that these causal relations really run in both directions and they involve any number of interacting systems. So before we, uh, I told you about results where climate change sort of caused the pandemic, but we can also think about other ways in which COVID um, and climate might relate. And in particular, there are a number of reasons to think that, that COVID could actually make it more difficult to combat climate change because we are kind of stressing a system that involves political and social actors and those actors need to be at least somewhat functional in order to take coordinated efforts to address uh, climate change. And in fact, we see the same pattern of relationship here that again, looking at the individuals within country, the more they adopt this interdependent self construal the more they think that COVID is going to make it more difficult to address climate change. And when we include an analysis with a broader set of predictors, we see very much the same pattern of results that collectivism is uniquely associated with agreement that um, COVID will make climate change more difficult. Now, there obviously are a number of open questions here we can't really pin down causality because we are measuring relations, but we really haven't kind of established that 
changes in collectivist self-control cause these changes in perceived relatedness between COVID and climate. There are, I think, some really fascinating questions about the bounds of these interrelatedness. So if we see health systems and climate systems as interrelated, how far out do we push those bounds before the perceived interrelatedness starts to um, fall apart? There also are some, I think, important questions about the degree to which um, having these recognitions of interrelated systems would actually increase support for a much broader range of environmental and equity policies, not just reducing carbon emissions, but really addressing all of the various systems that are affected by climate change. In conclusion, then, I, I want to kind of highlight that often when we talk about the relationship between culture and climate change, we emphasize cultural differences as they relate to ideology, as Matt's talk highlighted earlier today. We also will occasionally talk about the, the loss of cultures around the world as climate change imposes costs on their communities and environments. What the results I presented today suggest is that the sort of fundamental construal of the self as existing in an interrelated embedded social system can also influence the way we see how climate change affects the world around us. And that suggests maybe a different way to think about tackling the problem of climate change, that if we want to address climate change, maybe where we need to start is by changing the cultural construal, the ways in which we appreciate how interrelated we are with other people and with the environments in which we live. Thank you. All right, thanks, Leif. Um, so now we have about 10 minutes for the Q&A and you can keep typing questions into the chat when you have them, we're keeping track. Uh, but we'll start with a question for, for Matthew. Um, it's kind of a three-part question. So Atar Bertziger asked, do conservative educated white females show similar effects as males? And um, if not, do you have a hypothesis why males in particular? And then Nicole added, um, how does this intersect with notions of masculinity and femininity? Mm -hmm. Atari, this is an excellent question. And you know, from what I recall in our research, um, we found the conservative educated white, white effect regardless of gender. Um, and, but we didn't specifically test the difference between males and females. Um, just to stay focused on this key demographic group, um, because there's been a lot of early research on the white male effect specifically, and then McWright and Dunlap did their, their research on the conservative white male effect, um, showing that it's, you know, primarily males here, that's the key demographic group. So we just continued on with that focus. And some of the main theories behind it is um, you know, our identity protection, um, you know, the crises threaten your advantage position in society, which can then lead to dismissing the crisis. And then there's also the differential vulnerability perspective that, um, you know, it's this advantaged position in society that's associated with uh, decreased perceptions of risk from threats when you're more likely to dismiss them. Um, and, and Nicole, that's also a really super interesting question. I imagine there's some effect there that would align with, you know, this this political lens and having a strong right-wing ideology, such as valuing traditional gender roles and what masculinity versus femininity really means. And so I think that would be a really interesting um, empirical question to test further. It's a good one. Thanks. Um, so next we have a question for Emily and this is from Alexandra, I'm gonna mess up your last name, Beauchamp maybe. Um, and it is, do you think a message about climate change alone would be sufficient to increase salience of partisan identities? So maybe climate change alone is a cue for group identity. Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, that's a really astute observation and thought. I, I think because the issue of climate change, I mean, this is part of the problem of why framing is failing so much, right? Is because we hear climate change and it's like a trigger word. Um, it activates our partisan identities because the issue has been 
you know, hammered into all of our heads as a political and, and as a partisan issue over the past few decades. And so I, I would say, yes, likely um, the reason wh why we need to pay so much attention to the identity context and finding ways to activate um, these nonpartisan identities is because I think the baseline identity context when you're talking about climate change in the United States is a, is a partisan identity context. So that's why thinking about these nonpartisan identities becomes so important. Great, thanks. Um, so next, a question for Leaf, um, and this is from Caitlin. And she says, she's curious about what is going on with Sweden um, because it's in a different direction than all the other countries. And Sweden took a very different approach to COVID than other countries. So could this different relationship possibly be due to um, elite cues through policies about her herd immunity? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you're, you're not the first one to ask that. Um, they, I've gotten a number of private chat messages as well. What's up with Sweden? I, I think most of the world has been asking that question since early summer. Um, who knows what's up with Sweden? It's uh, you, when we look at other data, other questions in the, in the overall data set, Sweden does not behave unusually. So um, there are other, I won't go into detail about them, but there are other questions we're asking where Sweden looks very much like other countries. So it's not like qualitatively different in, in every way. I am, um, you know, I don't really know. So one thing I really want to explore was this um, finding that I mentioned that the degree to which, um, Jenny was just doing analysis about this last night, actually, that the degree to which and, and the, the way in which individualism or collectivism predict agreement actually changes as a function of the prevailing culture within the country. So remember those slopes differ for countries that were more collectivist versus more individualist. So that suggests that, there, that the, um, the collectivist self-construal might be highlighting different cultural aspects within the country that there might be, so that lends credence, I think, to this idea that there might be norms conveyed by political leaders. And what you're actually seeing is maybe more agreement in response to those kind of norms within the country. And so you get this, what looks like a very weird effect because that is the prevailing message. And the more people are kind of collectivist in their self-construal, the more they are embracing that message because it is something that the collective is actually expressing. That, I, you know, it's a really fascinating idea to explore. That was not something we predicted. Um, and so we'll follow up with future data. Um, and also Reiner has a reply to that question from Caitlin. He says, might this be due to the fact that Sweden is less diverse than other countries such as the UK? And uh, he also points out that having an interdependent self-concept is not the same as having a holistic cognitive style. Um, there's cross-cultural psych work looking at variations of interdependence of who the we with whom we are interdependent. Yeah, and I should mention obviously that we, owing to sort of space constraints in the survey, did not, me did not directly measure um, holistic versus analytical thinking. So we don't actually know concretely how closely associated those are. So there could be a, a separation between those two. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, great. And so I have another uh, two-part question for Matthew. So Janet Swim asks, what role do you think your findings have about um, the educated white male effect for higher education? Um, is higher education effort about climate change ineffective um, or backfiring? And then Nathan Geiger adds on to this, um, is the conservative white male effect additive or interactive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dan, this is such an excellent question. And that was actually one of the main limitations of our work. And it, it's a question, it's, I get this asked um, you know, often in relation to this paper. And you know, we, we don't know what it is about higher education that may be having this effect. I mean, I wouldn't say that you know, it's ineffective, but I mean, we are kind of seeing a little bit of backfire effects in some way if we're just kind of looking at it as this lump of higher education. Um, but not like we don't know what the quality is there, what, what's really explaining it. Um, so motivated reasoning, you know, likely plays a role. 
uh, being exposed to that contrary information. Um, and I'm sure it also depends on the concentration or the department, such as like business fields or liberal arts. Um, and that also the type of education that they're getting. And I imagine that it also has a lot to do with the response to the information they receive via higher education and also maybe even, you know, building relationships with in-group members who also share similar views. So it's like this culture in the university that could be um, contributing to it as well related to their, their political group. Um, and so I would say that that might, you know, those processes might have a bigger effect than really just higher education on its own. Um, I would love for some longitudinal research on this to examine groups over time um, to see, you know, like what are the key processes at work. Um, and Nathan, this is also a really, really excellent question and one that we specifically didn't go to in our work. Um, so we took McWright and Dunlap's additive approach to the conservative white male effect. And then we, we used that to interact it with education. So we kind of did like a mix of both. Um, and, you know, I can't really say for sure which I think is the primary process, but I imagine both play a role. Um, I, I do know that Milfont um, and colleagues came out with a paper recently where they found there was support for both explanations um, and that they found that ideologies add and interact to shape um, dismissiveness about climate change. So I can send you that link in the chat to that paper if you want to check that out. Um, okay, and so I'll do one more question for each speaker. So Emily, a question for you from Katie Lacoste is, do you think it's important that identity-based climate messages attribute climate effects to the identity? For example, do you need to explain how climate change impacts birds to enact the birding identity? Um, yeah, so, so that's a really interesting question. It's something that I, I wanna look into further. Um, I mean, one, one part of our study that, the study that was unexpected was the fact that the frame in and of itself had had a significant effect, which kind of conflicts with a lot of the um, a lot of the prior research on how, how framing effects tend to tend to not be um, very effective on climate change. Um, so, you know, what what has to go into the frame versus what has to go into the identity prime is definitely a question that I want to unpack further and, and it needs to be unpacked. I did particularly choose uh, to use a frame that resonated with the, the nonpartisan identity um, because I felt like it matching the frame to the salient identity is an important part of that process of that theoretical framework, right? If I activate your parental identity and then give you uh, a frame about the impact of climate change on you know fishing and fish populations i don't think that that's going to be effective i think you do have to have a match there between the salient nonpartisan identity and the frame but it's definitely something i i'm really interested to look into further great um and a last question for relief is from esther poppies and she says um, increasing people's sense of interconnectedness seems helpful and important. Do you have any thoughts on uh, how to do this short of all becoming Buddhists? Maybe that's not such a bad start actually <laughs> in, in a number of ways. Um, you know, I'm really not the expert on, on that particular question. Others on the team in particular, uh, David, I don't know if he's still on, on the call or not, and, and Kimmen have done much more work surrounding um, interdependent self-construal and various predictors and tried to work with different ways of priming cultural construal to temporarily change that. It, it's difficult, right? I mean, I think there's, um, the culture reflects long-standing traditions of different societies and they are not easily changed overnight. But one thing that we do know is just factually true is that there are these interacting interrelated systems and that seems like it might be a useful place to start that we come to recognize a different social and natural systems are related. Does that really change the culture? I'm not, I'm not sure, but it wouldn't be a bad place to start. Okay, thanks.
All right. Well, I believe everyone's back now uh, from the uh, breakout rooms. And so, um, you know, the, this session is going to be our second data blitz session of the day. Um, and so uh, in for this session, there'll be five speakers, each speaking for five minutes about their research. Um, just as we have in the past, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we're going, um, as the speakers are going, and then we'll kind of save all the Q&A until the end. Um, and I do want to point out that um, we do have, uh, out of the five speakers, we have three student speakers. And so we'll be doing a vote for best student uh, blitz uh, speaker in this session at the end of this session. Um, so we'll provide a link at the end of the session. And actually, right before you go to breakout rooms, we're going to ask you to go vote on that link um, because we'll be tabulating everything while we're in the breakout rooms um, because this is the last formal speaking session of the day. We'll, we'll do this speaking session, we'll have the breakout rooms, and then we'll have a, a kind of wrap up uh, after this, after this um, session. Um, okay, uh, and so to begin, um, uh, we're going to start with um, Everly Jazzy. Um, she's a graduate student at The Ohio State University, and um, she'll be talking about nature connectedness, well-being, and combat health disparities. So feel free to share your screen. Yeah, so can everyone see my screen? Okay. So um, hi, I'm Everly Jazzy. I'm from Ohio State. I'm a graduate student, and I will be talking some about my research on the association between psychological well-being and natural spaces and how nature connectedness and other um, facets of familiarity with nature um, can moderate the benefits, um, particularly for marginalized groups. That's the health equity part. Um, as part of the climate change at the crossroads theme, I will also briefly touch on how climate change can be addressed through nature connectedness as well. And um, this was a little beyond my scope of work, but I touched on it a little. And um, as you may know, there have been countless studies, observational, experimental, and otherwise showing that there are unique properties of natural spaces leading them to have associations with health and well being outcomes. Um, not everyone has the same access to quality nature, and there are also barriers and constraints causing disparate use of these spaces. So it's likely that um, marginalized groups in society, particularly in the US, those people of um, low SES backgrounds, people of color and others that don't have the same use and access um, to natural spaces end up recreating um, less than their advantaged peers and could have individual differences in the benefits they receive from nature. Because of that, that's what I decided to study, um, looking at varying levels of nature connectedness and familiarity, um, which I'll talk about in a process I called the tripartite model of green place attachment. Um, and I wanted to see how these variables interacted with walks in nature and psychological well-being and affective benefits. Um, my goal, since I'm just a master's student, I was um, just going to start this theoretical investigation and get the methods down to then inspire future research, um, whether it is to supplement pro-environmental behavior research or in my own interest in health equity, um, which I'll talk to in another slide. So my study started as an experiment with two 45 minute walks um, set in either green or built routes. Unfortunately, my pilot was interrupted by coronavirus. So I moved on to quasi experimental design, which I used for the summer and fall collection. In total, 306 students took my survey um, in that quasi experiment and um, used measures or uh, answered items about um, nature connectedness with Susan Clayton's EID, a measure of well being and negative affective measures. And um, I created a framework, and this framework explains more about my concept for the study. And um, it's just a framework that I hope to build on for future research and that others can use um, to identify more about um, green place attachment or familiarity. Um, as a social and an individual construct. 
Um, and this equigenic effect hypothesis um, was illustrated by Mitchell and Popham in 2008, but um, Mitchell et al. 2015 used observational data from 34 countries and they found that there are larger proportional benefits for those people of low SES once they finally gain access to neighborhood green space more than their high SES peers, which is the basis of why equity could come from green space attachment and um, access to green space. Um, I just have preliminary results right now. So um, I found that going on repeated walks that are more natural led to increased well being. That might be related to goal attainment theory, like assuming that people's goals is to um, get restoration from nature. Um, and then I also found a significant reduction in negative affect for vulnerable populations, in this case, first generation students and Pell Grant recipients. Um, which are my measures for socioeconomic status, and I'm still trying to parse out why. So my results show that perhaps green space can lead to equity for low SES and first generation students, which is in line with most of the work that has come out of the equigenic theory. Um, I am hoping to continue this work to find out more about who benefits from nature and um, also show how nature connectedness can bring about health benefits. There are associations with nature connectedness and increased pro-environmental behavior, which I hope to study further. I ran um, process moderation analyses, but overall models were not significant, um, even though interactions were significant. So I hope to explore my promising trends later with a larger, more diverse sample. And besides exploring the equigenic effect, I think that future research can look at how environmental justice relates to benefits from nature, especially inequitable impact of climate change, as recent work um, found differences in perceptions of health issues by neighborhood environments and interactions with climate change action. So um, that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Right, thank you very much. All right, um, so then um, our next Blitz talk will be coming from Lorraine Lavallee. She is an assistant professor at University of Northern British Columbia, and she'll be talking about personal cap and trade systems to create better environmental citizens. I think you need to unmute yourself if you're able to. There we go. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a radical proposal of using cap and trade systems with citizens, not just with industry, um, to try and create more um, uh, and better environmental citizens. So now, why is my slide not moving? Oops, there we go. Okay, uh, three times Canadians elected Stephen Harper as prime minister, three times. He's a person aligned with the fossil fuel industry and ideologically opposed to climate action. This stalled federal action on climate change in Canada for a decade. Uh, 2016, you all know Americans did the same thing. So many of our North American citizens are disconnected from the severity of environmental problems and from their responsibility in assuring that these problems are addressed now. So the students in my lab and I are interested in finding ways to reconnect them. And we're investigating personal cap and trade systems as one method of doing this. So cap and trade system is a market mechanism to decrease pollution. So far, these systems have only been used with industry but the British government has seriously considered a cap and trade system with carbon emissions applied to citizens. So it works in this way. A national carbon emissions target is set for citizens pollution. I've set this for Canadians. The target is divided among the population. So let's say each person would be given one ton of free carbon pollution per year. So that's their pollution cap. 
Initially, this cap is set high to give people and the marketplace time to transition, but the cap decreases every year, so your pollution budget gets smaller and smaller over time. So when an individual travels in airplanes, purchases fossil fuels for their car, boat, lawnmower, or for home heating and cooling, they'll start to use their one ton allocation. So if you need to exceed one ton in the year, you have to purchase carbon allocations from people who don't need all of theirs. So that's the pollution trading part of cap and trade. And it creates a cost for polluting if you um, use more than your cap or need to use more than your cap and a financial incentive for people to use less than their cap and sell their excess. So this would be a mandatory um, system for the population, which makes it a collective approach to reducing national emissions. All right, from a human psychology perspective, a cap and trade system is really interesting. It gives individuals feedback about the pollution they're producing in everyday life, and it allows them to keep track of their cumulative pollution relative to individual pollution targets. Now, the major pricing system that governments use is carbon taxes, and carbon taxes have only three of these seven motivational features of a cap and trade system. Now, the main impact of market mechanisms is not actually on individual behavior. These systems are so powerful because they transform the economy away from emissions production. But we're psychologists and we're interested in the ways that carbon pricing systems can transform individuals. So change the way that people think about and prioritize environmental issues. So psychologically, we expect a cap and trade system to foster a sense of efficacy at achieving uh, national carbon reduction targets. If people feel like they can't really do much to address a global problem like climate change, then they might as well ignore it. A cap and trade system could give people a sense that collectively we can make a difference. And this sense of efficacy will enable people to confront the problem more directly. A cap and trade system should also increase individual sense of personal responsibility for uh, addressing climate change, which is normally a strong predictor of risk perceptions and of prioritization. So we examine these relations in a sample of 384 Canadian participants on MTurk. Participants first watched a short video on climate change and then watched a second video that described either a cap and trade system or a carbon tax system. So let's first look at the efficacy results. The efficacy questions related specifically to carbon mitigation systems. Participants indicated that a cap and trade system would give them a significantly stronger sense of efficacy at reducing climate change than would a carbon tax system. Okay, but what about the predicted relations among these variables that we were hypothesizing. So the mediation analysis that we ran tested whether efficacy perceptions associated with either mitigation system was associated with prioritizing environmental issues by increasing a sense of personal responsibility and perceptions for climate change risk. Among non-conservative participants, which were the majority of our sample, the predicted path was significant. For the 12% of our sample who were political conservatives, the sequence was actually similar. In fact, the association between efficacy and personal responsibility was stronger, um, but risk perceptions were not part of the mediated sequence. So in other words, for both conservatives and non-conservatives, prioritizing environmental issues relative to economic growth was associated with feelings of efficacy at addressing climate change and feelings of personal responsibility for doing so. And a cap and trade system has significant potential for increasing both. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, so um, again, uh, as your question are coming in if you can put them in the chat we'll continue we'll save all the questions for the end um, so then um, the next uh, presentation will be from um, Lexi Sharmer she's a PhD candidate at University of Minnesota who'll be talking about a meta-analysis on the efficacy of functional message mapping and promoting sustainability great just one second I lost my mouse All right, so yes, I'm excited to talk today about um, a portion of this meta-analysis that we did on functional message matching, particularly in the sustainability domain. It's actually come up quite a bit so far in this pre-conference, so a lot of your work seems to be kind of related to this topic. But before I kind of hop into the details of our results in the meta-analysis, it's probably important to put forward a couple of definitions. The first of which being like, what is functional message matching? Um, so. First, message matching is this pretty broad range of persuasive techniques where some feature of the message is altered to match the characteristics of the people to whom the message is being delivered. So oftentimes it's the content of the message that's being matched to some kind of personality characteristic of the people who might be receiving the message. Um, so functional message matching is a subset of this kind of intervention where it's matched to the motivation of the individual in particularly. Uh, so when we're looking at the kinds of studies that were included in our meta-analysis, they had to meet these criteria. First, it had to have this functional message matching intervention approach. So participants had to like read one of several messages and then answer the relevant dependent variables. Uh, there had to be a comparison group present. So if the only group besides the match was like a no message control, it would have been excluded. Uh, it had to have a dependent variable that was either an attitude, an intention, or a behavior, and in all cases, these are observed behaviors. So like an attitude towards the ad or the persuasive message itself would be not included in this. Uh, it had to have a between person design and importantly, it had to have um, the matching criteria had to be categorical. So for example, if it was matched to a political orientation measured continuously, it wouldn't be included in this meta-analysis because um, the effects are quite difficult to extract uh, consistently and those kinds of things. So here's an example of a study that would have been included. It had past and future framed um, environmental arguments and it was tailored to either liberals or conservatives. So the results were categorical by liberal and conservative and we could extract both main effects and interactions from this kind of study. So when we look at the way that the studies were identified, we started with nearly 40,000 papers. Um, and then in the original non-sustainability focused one, there were 400 papers that were relevant, but this, these results are about 35 papers which include 51 studies that meet the inclusion criteria and 291 effect size estimates. So we're dealing with quite a bit of data here. And um, just generally the overview is that uh, main effects and interactions are all treated separately here. And then the type of dependent variable, if it's a cognitive variable or a behavioral variable are separate. So the cognitive variables are attitudes and intentions grouped together. And to orient you to the results, any positive meta-analytic R would indicate that the matched very or the matched message outperformed the mismatched or non-matched message. So generally we see that across the types of dependent variables and effects, message matching is an effective type of intervention. So we break this down and look at moderators. Uh, one might be the kind of um, outcome that we're looking at or the type of thing that's being advocated for in the message. So we see that some of the five most common ones used are green products or services, donations to pro-environmental organizations, um, recycling behaviors, energy conservations, or waste reduction behaviors. And basically across these kinds of domains, message matching is generally effective. Some of these have kind of small um, study numbers. The K is the number of studies that were included. So the error bars get to be quite large, but basically message matching is effective except in the donation domain. There's a little bit of mixed evidence. Um, additionally, if we think about the way that the characteristic of the individual was assessed, this might be important. So if it was directly measured through some type of psychological inventory, indirectly inferred perhaps by some type of demographic variable or manipulated usually by priming, um, message matching is generally effective. There's a little bit more mixed evidence in the ones in which uh, the characteristic is directly measured. 
But this is good news because more scalable interventions generally can't afford to like measure a psychological variable every time they're trying to match anyway. So in the more scalable versions, we see evidence that um, message matching is an effective kind of intervention style. Lastly, if we look at the type of population that was used in the study, student, online, so like mTOR prolific samples or offline community samples, Again, basically across populations, message matching is an effective intervention style, except in this online behavior seems to be the exception. Um, so the implications are that across domains, message matching is pretty effective. Um, we, there's just mixed message or mixed results in donations and uh, those directly measured intervention styles. I want to thank the newly minted Dr. Kevin Joyle de Marais, whose dissertation this is kind of a part of. Molly Madzellin and Jolene C who helped in the coding and then the two faculty advisors, Alex Rothman and Mark Snyder who worked on this project. All right, thank you very much. It's always good to see a meta-analysis demonstrating some of the things that we hope are true. So um, let's, uh, let's continue on. Again, you can put your questions um, in the chat. Um, next uh, will be, um, Matthew Sisko, he is a PhD candidate at Columbia University, presenting about finite pool of worry or finite pool of attention regarding climate. So um, yes, please begin. Hey, thanks a lot. So I will present some work examining if humans have a finite pool of worry and examining if humans have a finite pool of attention to climate change, specifically in the face of a new threat such as COVID-19. So we're using the COVID pandemic as a natural experiment. So COVID global cases have been increasing over time, especially over 2020. And that begs the question, what effect does the uh, prevalence of a new threat like this have on climate change attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors? So we're gonna look at two psychological variables related to climate change, specifically worry about climate change and attention to climate change. and with both of these, there are a few possible effects that a new threat like COVID-19 might have. So one possibility is that there's no effect. They continue on doing whatever they would have um, without COVID-19 being present. Some past literature predicts that we would see a crowding out effect, which has been termed a finite pool of worry effect. And in the current paper, we also extend this hypothesis to examine a finite pool of attention effect. Another possibility is that we actually see a generalization of worry such that as a new threat like COVID-19 comes uh, into play, we actually see a increase in either climate worry or attention to climate change as a result. So now I'm gonna show some evidence that has tried to identify which of these scenarios um, is borne out. So we collected a lot of data from three different countries focusing on two main cities within each country. We collected data longitudinally starting in December 2019 and then continuing through July 2020, so including before and after the COVID pandemic began and got going. And we, throughout this time period, collected about 17,000 survey responses and also monitored news and social media about COVID-19, climate change, and some other threats. So let's take a look at some of our results. First, I'm going to show you regression coefficient estimates that identify the association between local COVID-19 cases and these outcome variables that you see on the y-axis here. These control for demographic variables, time fixed effects, and geographic fixed effects. In the main paper, we look at a variety of other threats as comparisons. In this short talk, I'll just compare climate change and problems with the economy as two different threats. So reg regarding problems with the economy, we see, as we would expect, strong positive associations between local coronavirus cases and worry about the economy, as well as attention to economic problems. So we operationalize attention as self-reported discussions and thoughts about economic problems. With climate change, we see a different pattern. 
So we do see evidence for this finite pool of attention hypothesis. We see that there's a negative association with attention to climate change operationalized by self-reported discussions and thoughts about climate change. But we don't see evidence for a finite pool of worry effect. Rather, we see some evidence in the opposite direction, suggesting potentially an affect generalization effect. So a model specification that's even stronger that we also ran with our data capitalizes on some of the repeated measures data that we have. So in our original survey, we have about 1,000 participants that answered the survey at two points in time. So we can then look at how their change over time within person in COVID-19 worry is associated with their change over time in climate change worry. What we find, consistent with the results that I just showed you, is a significant positive effect. And we attempted to replicate this with a new repeated measure sample, this time using about 2,500 participants, about nationally representative of United States, uh, the United States population. And we see a reproduction of this same effect. Again, not showing evidence for a finite pool of worry effect, but rather showing some evidence for the opposite, potentially an affect generalization effect. What happened at the level of news and social media? So what, what's going on at the macro level? So we looked at news attention to COVID-19, again, in these three countries here indexed by language instead of the specific country. The, we looked at the association between news attention to COVID-19 and news attention to other worries, such as climate change and the economy. And we see that same crowding out regarding attention. So a finite pool of attention effect also showing up here. And we see essentially the same results when we look at social media data across these three countries um, over the course of that same timeline that I mentioned to you earlier. So in sum, across a variety of data, model specifications, and continents, we see support for a finite pool of attention. And we don't find support for a finite pool of worry effect. Rather, we see some evidence that worries may generalize, such as when people hear and think about COVID-19 and start to feel worry, instead of those worries um, affecting climate change negatively, when they then turn their attention to climate change, we find that their worries are as intense or perhaps more intense due to being primed with worries about COVID-19 beforehand. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, um, you can continue putting questions for all of the speakers in the chat. Um, uh, the final blitz speaker will be uh, Atar Herzeger. Um, Atar is a postdoctoral researcher at The Ohio State University, and we'll be talking about um, identity-based motivation and electric vehicle adoption. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Um, today, what I'm going to be talking about is some initial findings on how and why symbolic value might be associated with the adoption of electric vehicles or EVs. So we know from previous literature that individuals who perceive electric vehicles to be highly symbolic, those individuals who see EVs as an expressive possession are more likely than others to tend to want to adopt these EVs for their next vehicle purchase. The problem is that symbolic value is a fuzzy concept. And we know from other literature on expressive possessions that they tend to have two facets. They can be both characterizing in that they embody the owner's values, but they can also be communicative in that they signal something about the owner to others. And in previous literature on EV adoption in particular, these facets tend to be conflated. Um, so we think of characterization as the extent to which the individual holds EV congruent identities, such as being pro-environmental. And we think of communication as the extent to which the individual believes that EV ownership communicates status and signal to others. But the question is, which of these facets really matters for EV adoption? Identity-based motivation theory uh, potentially can shed some light on this question. And the theory states that identity motivates behavior and behavior in turn reinforces identity, which forms a cyclical relationship between identity and behavior. And for the uh, kind of domain of EVs more specifically, what we hypothesized was that based on this theory, engaging with an EV, for example, through a test drive experience, would strengthen the symbolic value of the EV, and in particular, the characterization aspects of it, so those aspects that are related to identity. And that, in turn, would reinforce the individual's EV congruent identity and lead to higher adoption intent. 
And we were able to test this hypothesis in a quasi-experimental design um, in collaboration with Smart Columbus, which is a federally funded program that aims to transform the transportation sector in the city of Columbus, in part by uh, increasing the market share of electric vehicles. So participants in our study were attendees at uh, free EV test driving events that were uh, conducted across the city. And what we did was intercept with these participants before and after they test drove an EV. And we were able to survey them about perceptions of both the EV and the self. What we hypothesized in line with identity-based motivation theory was that post-drive changes in self-perception would be associated with higher intent to adopt an electric vehicle for your next uh, car purchase. In our survey, we measured EV perception, self-perception, and the intent to adopt an EV at post-drive. Um, and then for EV perceptions, we were really focused on signaling attributes. So we were interested in whether participants saw the EV as signaling status and prestige to others, but we also measured the extent to which the EV was seen as instrumental and, and environmental. And when measuring self-perceptions, we accounted for three identities that were shown in previous literature to be congruent with EV adoption. And those were early technology adopter, pro-environmental, and car authority identity. Car authority identity in particular speaks to the extent to which the participants think that they're an expert on all things vehicle related in their social circle. And our dependent variable was the participants reported likelihood to purchase, drive, or recommend an EV to others. Now, what I'm graphing out here in the results um, on the left, these are the variables that we measured in EV and self-perceptions and their changes at post-drive. So compared to pre-drive, what were the changes after test driving the EV vehicle? And uh, the coefficients in green, the further they are to the right, the more positive and larger they are, as long as they don't overlap with the dotted line, which means that they're insignificant at that, at that point. Uh, what we see in this graph is that post-drive changes in perception of the self, uh, thinking about the self as holding stronger EV congruent identities was predictive of higher adoption intent, in particular for pro-environmental and car authority identities, whereas perceptions of the vehicle as signaling status and prestige, that change in perception of the vehicle did not predict adoption intent, intent post-drive, and neither did perceptions of the vehicle as instrumental or environmental. So to summarize, we find that changes in perceptions of the self rather than the EV are closely associated with EV adoption. And test driving EVs can change self perceptions, which is an important tool to encourage adoption. Adoption, not because the EV is considered more attractive after the test drive, but because the self more strongly identifies as a potential EV owner. And therefore our implications are that we should really focus campaigns on this experience and change self perception in campaigns rather than talking about the attributes of the vehicle. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, um, you know, those were our uh, five Blitz speakers. I just wanted to check. Um, we are going to ask you to please, um, but right before we get into the questions, um, to please vote for your uh, the best student blitz. So three, there were three, three of the presenters were students. There's a link in the chat right now um, if you'd like to go vote. Um, and now we'll start doing some some Q and A. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to start off by um, asking Everly a question. Um, and so um, from uh, Micah Kersher, what factors did you use to measure well-being in your participants? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I started out with my pilot study um, with psychological well-being scale by Rife, two or 1995. Um, but then I really quickly realized that students have a unique amount of stress and experience with that. And then um, their self-exploration may not be to the um, like same level of like mid life adults or later in life adults. Um, so then I changed to the WEM, WEM, WBS scale um, from the UK um, and added an attention check for, um, to make sure that people weren't just putting the same number um, and I used a momentary version of that um, because it is asking about the past week and I can um, put that in the chat. 
Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so the next question um, is for Lorraine. And um, this question is from uh, Atar, um, but uh, I don't know if you'd rather verbalize, but uh, essentially, are there other examples of cap and trade implemented on once unregulated resources? So is there a risk of reactance following the implementation of the system or even un unlawful behavior? Yeah, good question, Zatar. So right now there's um, carbon markets for industry. So California has a carbon market. Uh, the province of Quebec has a carbon market. With the carbon market in Quebec, individuals can participate in it. I don't know exactly how the system works, but um, they have, I guess, some way of um, uh, being able to document their um, carbon use and, uh, and to sell and trade carbon. So, you know, a lot about the system and how the system will actually work on citizens um, will be part of what really needs to be worked out. And, uh, and so in terms of reactants to implement this system, yes, <laughs> there, there certainly would be. So that we'd have to do a lot in advance to, um, to prepare people for this kind of system. We'd have to find really good ways of selling it. Um, with things like um, uh, carbon taxes, in some ways, if you can get um, more right-wing governments to implement them, you have a better chance of success. So that's one of the key things to do is to get, um, to get conservatives and conservatives will be interested in, in a trading aspect in a market mechanism to some extent. In my province, um, uh, the carbon taxes were introduced by our, our right-wing government called, called a liberal government, but, um, but that's part of the way that it actually happened. All right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, um, I'll direct the, the next question uh, to, to Matthew. This question's from Greg Sparkman. Um, you know, it's a relief to see that worry for climate change does not decline over time during the pandemic. And I wonder if the most relevant question is if concern for climate change would have gone up even more if there had been no pandemic. If it would have gone up, um, then maybe we could infer there's actually, there actually is a finite pool of worry and COVID was maybe keeping the climate worry down. Um, do you have data uh, to speak to this? Yeah, so for sure we can't know exactly what would have happened in that counterfactual. If we look at um, changes over time in climate change concern in the US from one year to the next, um, we don't see the, we wouldn't make a prediction from just a linear trend that it would have gone up a lot more than it has over time. So I don't know if we have reason to believe that it would have gone up a lot more over time if it wasn't for the COVID. However, we do have in 2019, these um, global activist events that really spurred a lot of attention. Uh, I saw that in some Google Trends data and also in some news about climate change data. So maybe you could argue that something new has happened recently. Um, but to address that as best as we could, we do control for time in all of our regression specifications. And we also use COVID cases on a daily basis. So that means our analysis looking at the association between COVID cases and our outcome variables like climate worry, it's not just looking at before versus after the COVID started, but it's taking advantage of the fact that we have ups and downs over time in COVID cases throughout our time frame. Um, so we're not just looking at a, a potential just correlation um, over time in climate change concern, but actually how does it differ from one day to the next um, and one period to the next throughout the, the COVID crisis. So we can't know for sure, but I think the pretty strong specifications that we have show that um, there is uh, not strong evidence for a finite pool of worry effect, but hard to uh, hard to say what would have happened uh, in a different in a different world, of course. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, a question um, directed at Lexi, um, you know, from this this meta analysis, uh, I was, you know, what are some of the common motivational characteristics or just other common characteristics that really led to the to the functional interventions being the most effective? Like, if you had takeaway messages from for that. So there's a pretty wide range of things that were matched to in the studies that were included here. So a lot of the ones that were indirectly inferred, inferred from some type of demographic characteristic was like individualism and collectivism from home country. That was a pretty common one. And then they would use like group or individual appeals to match. 
But in the direct measured one, sometimes it was like regulatory focus. So if you had a promotion versus prevention focus, and then they give you like a gain versus loss frame, um, or you can manipulate control level. So sometimes it was like temporarily near versus distant events. And then like if they were feasibility or durability appeals, or there's any number of things you could match on. Um, so we don't actually have the comparison versus like non-functional things because those studies were excluded just because there were like far too many in the long term. We hope to be able to make those comparisons, but we have to go back and recode all of those and just like the timeline it didn't end up working out that we could look at like just gain loss frames, which is another important kind of like tailoring to match the situation. But basically there's just a ton of stuff that was included in here. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, and um, my next question is directed towards uh, Atar. Um, but just thinking about your study, uh, you know, not every consumer is going to test drive an EV, and and and, and thinking about, you know, how could these identity identity based motivations be triggered um, for folks who maybe aren't trying a, an EV, or or could be scaled up in some way beyond just um, people who are like at the car dealership trying out cars. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we do have um, other research that suggests that there's also relevance of temporal proximity. So being close to a purchase in time matters too. And um, getting people at the dealership is actually a great way to do that. They're at the dealership because they're interested in making a decision soon. Um, but if but if we can't do that, then there are other ways to engage consumers in, in a way that they'll be exposed to these, uh, these expressive possessions, even without coming to the dealership voluntarily. So we could do, um, there. I've seen now that it's really trending to do like virtual uh, simulated test drives on vehicles. Um, there are a lot of YouTube videos that do these virtual test drives, especially now during the COVID pandemic, that's become, I guess, you know, one um, avenue for a solution space for dealerships. But then um, there's also just uh, information search that consumers do when they're on the market for something that doesn't require them to physically go to a dealership, but we can expose them to campaigns via ads online, via commercials, right? There, there are other ways that, um, that we can uh, trigger or activate these identities. Actually, I was really happy to see identities come up so much in, in the previous talks today. But yeah, activating, identi activating an identity doesn't necessitate exposure to the product face-to-face. Uh, Yes, that um, when you mentioned commercials, I don't know how many of you saw the Super Bowl, but there was that very long commercial about how you know America really needs to step up the EVs. So um, who knows? It could be trying to get at all different identities there. Um, all right, um, we have another question um, directed uh, uh, for Lorraine. Um, and this question is kind of getting at, you know, uh, how does a personal cap and trade system, and this is from Michael Schmidt, how does a personal cap and trade system relate to equity issues or how could that yeah, be tied into this system? Yeah, there's definitely equity issues with any kind of pricing system. So there's a risk that it will have be a bigger burden on lower income people um, than higher income people. Initially, when the cap is set high, that shouldn't be a problem and it should really target people, the highest 10% of income earners. And, um, and they should help to create the market conditions to make things like electric cars more affordable for other people. So you have them pressing the, the change to make it easier for lower income people to, um, to transition when the cap starts to go down. But, so, you know, you really have to look at what your cap is set at and who that's going to affect. And with so many of these policies, you want complementary policies. So like with the carbon tax in British Columbia, lower income people actually get sent a check um, to get money back to offset the impact of paying a carbon tax because it's such a regressive tax. And so you want these complementary policies in place along with the cap and trade system to make sure that everyone is able to adopt the kinds of changes that's going to um, reduce their, their um, carbon footprint. All right, well, thank you. Um, and so um, it's, it's about five o'clock, so I think 
Uh, we have one more question. Sorry, it just came in. Um, so we'll do one more question. Um, all right, so this question is for Matthew from Atar. Uh, you know, is increased worry necessarily a good thing? Is, is there also a sense of being more able to cope with these stressors? Um, might that be reflected? So I think right now, increased worry is a good thing. We also looked at some other outcome measures that I didn't show, like policy support. We do see increased policy support um, as, in terms of an association with COVID worry and an association with COVID cases prevalent. So at the end of the day, we do still see that this is translating into um, some at least motivations for behaviors that are important. Um, but yeah, eventually too much worry might lead to coping mechanisms, I agree. So I think in the long term, we want to be careful, of course, not to exploit this, um, this power of uh, people ready to take, take action when they're feeling worried um, too much. All right, well, thank you. Um, so before we open up the breakout rooms, each of the speakers will have a breakout room. If you'd like to go talk to them individually, please feel free to go join those. Um, just a reminder about the rest of the day. Um, so uh, after, the breakout, after the breakout rooms, we will return back here at 5.15 to kind of do a wrap up. We'll announce the award winners and we'll just kind of have some closure for the day. Um, so please come join us uh, for that after the breakout rooms. And then um, finally at 6 p.m., we are having a virtual happy hour, BYOB. So if you'd like to just come chat and uh, talk about what the research or just, you know, talk about anything else, feel free to come join us back then as well. Um, all right. If you haven't yet voted, the poll is right there in the chat. Make sure you vote and then we'll open up the breakout rooms now for you all to have individualized discussions with our speakers. But thank, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. So uh, welcome back everyone. And I'm gonna keep you in suspense just a little bit longer on the, the student awards. But um, I, if you could all join me in virtually giving another round of applause to our 17 speakers and our 27 poster presenters. I always leave this pre-conference feeling a combination of exhausted and energized um, because I've been so stimulated by so many different ideas. And I know that I now need to go back to my lecture slides and update with all of this new knowledge for my classes on what do we know about climate change and to answer preliminary questions of how it relates to COVID. Um, some of you have made the comment that, oh, things have gone smoothly. That is not because of technology. That is because of this group of people who have been behind the scenes coordinating in Google documents and taking control of uh, the, the Zoom host control. So thank you to the organizing committee for pulling this off. Um, if like me, you're thinking, oh, you do need to update lecture slides or you want references um, for speakers who have given us permission, we will post their slides to Open Science Framework. Um, I will try to get those up tomorrow. Um, the posters will be available on Whova for the remainder of the conference. And I wanna say maybe through till May, you, we have access to everything on the SPSP Whova site for quite a few months. And eventually, um, the, the recordings we think maybe will appear on Whova this week. Eventually, we will have access and we'll be able to share them publicly. And I will keep you all apprised of this. I have everyone's email addresses, so I will let you know when those become available. Um, I will send an email out tomorrow with a post-conference survey. We would love to get your feedback on what you thought of this, what worked well, what didn't work well. And I made a pitch this morning, but if you've gotten to the end of the day and you have ideas bubbling of what you'd like to see next year at this pre-conference, please email me. Uh, to express your interest in joining the organizing committee. I'm also looking to pass the baton for the next chair of the conference. We do recommend that you've maybe served on the organizing committee before, before taking on that responsibility. And I also mentioned this morning, and I know we had an early start for those of you on the West Coast. Um, if you this isn't just a conference, it's a community. And if you want to stay connected with us through your SPSP membership, uh, there's a sustainability forum, so if you just log into the SPSP website and hit that big orange connect button, you can see there's a sustainability forum you can sign up for. 
And just to reiterate that this pre-conference was co-sponsored by APA Division 34, uh, which is the Society for Environmental Population and Conservation Psychologists. Many of us are members of both of these professional societies. And I actually want to turn it over to Amanda Carrico, who is the membership chair of Division 34, to say a little bit more. Awesome, thanks, uh, Kim, and thanks everyone. This has been an awesome day. I just wanna make sure that if you're not aware of us, Division 34, that you check us out. Uh, we're a professional association that's housed within the APA system. Um, we benefit from the support that APA provides us, but we also work quite a lot with other organizations that connect to issues related to environment, psychology, sustainability, climate, all the things we've been hearing about today. Um, you don't have to be a member of APA to be a member of Division 34. Uh, our goal is to offer a professional community for those that are interested in these questions. Uh, we have a big tent. We have a lot of members who are not identified as psychologists or who don't really um, hang out with the APA crowd quite as much. And so we're all welcome. So check us out. There's a lot of great benefits to being a member of the division. Uh, we have access to two different listservs. We organize monthly webinar series. Uh, this year, we have a really new and exciting forum in collaboration with several other uh, divisions within APA that's looking at the link between psychology and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but possibly most important, it's a way to support this growing field, to give back to the community, to make sure we're a, a vibrant and growing community of scholars. Uh, we organize annual awards. We also organize a track at the main APA meeting that's focused on these topics. Uh, so check us out, and I'm always happy to answer questions. If you'd like to, to hear a little bit more, you can just shoot me an email. I'll put that in the chat as well. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Actually, Greg, I think we can turn it over to you. Let me stop sharing to announce the student award winners. All right, go ahead and share my screen. Okay. There we go. So uh, thanks everybody for holding on to the very last bit. I know you've been waiting with bated breath to find out um, who will win. Um, so every year we uh, like to recognize people who have made outstanding contributions to the field of sustainable uh, psychology. And <clears throat> this year we're actually going to be giving out three awards as we had two blitz sessions and we thought um, each having their own made more sense having people compete uh, given recency effects, etc. So first we will announce the poster award. So this year's 2021 SVSB Sustainability Pre-Conference Student Poster Award winner is, I needed to get some audio clip of a drum roll. Normally everyone would be patting their legs right now. You can do it at home. You can participate. Okay. Is Johanna Matt Navarro for their poster titled On the Generalizability of Lab Preferences to Environmental Behavior Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Congratulations. All right. Next, for the first session, the Student Blitz Award is Karen Chai for the Blitz titled Building Diverse Climate Coalitions, the Pitfalls and Promise of Identity-Based Messaging. And last but not least, for the second Blitz session, <clears throat> our award winner is Matthew Sisko for the Blitz titled A Finite Pool of Worry, Finite Pool of Attention, Evidence, and Qualifications. So for each of you, you'll get an email from me sometime in the very near future so I can get your address and then magically in the mail, you will receive a mug. Uh, all right, and I don't know if I'm gonna hand off to anybody else for the last part, but if not, we have our happy hour at 6 p.m., which will be hosted um, via Zoom in breakout rooms. Does anyone else wanna say anything else about that piece? Um, bring your own beverage. As Katie said, we really, some of us really are going to have beverages. We will create separate breakout rooms if you want to get together on research or on just hanging out. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Normally, if we were in person, we would be walking together to a bar. And I realize you can't even see me right now, but <laughs> Sorry. Um, we hope that you'll join us because it'd be great to, to interact with more of you whom we normally see and all of the newcomers. So thank you all. And we'll see you in about 40 minutes. Wait, just a minute, Katie. Could you spotlight me for just a second? We can't let this conference end without a major shout out to Kim Wolski for <laughs> shepherding us through all of this for the past year of uh, like a huge amount of work without a lot of outside support. So 
huge shout out to Kim for this. Well, thank you for that. I was happy to do it. This is one of, like, I will keep saying this is a community and I love you all. So I'm happy to do this, even if we can't all be together in person. 